We are live. Great. Hello and welcome everyone to the virtual conference on future of shared economy by Entrepreneur India. I'm Preetima Bhardwaj Project at Webinars at Entrepreneur India. Today's discussion will revolve around the next big opportunity, trends for shared economy. The agenda to be discussed during the session is shared economy businesses would need to rethink what creates value, what is important right now and in the future, and what role digital innovation can play in making new things happen. Let me start by laying out the ground rules for our attendees. The discussion will go on for 90 minutes. This will be followed by a question and answer session for the next 20 minutes. If you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Mention in your question if it is directed at any specific panelist. We will take up questions post the panel discussion. Please participate in poll during the webinar. We would also to request the attendees to keep the question within the scope of discussion here today and not pitch their businesses. Let me now introduce our session moderator, Ms. Ritu Maria, the Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur India and Asia Pacific. Our first session for the day would be for about 45 minutes and it will talk about co-working, co-living and hospitality. Our panelists today are Dharamveer Singh Chauhan, co-founder and CEO Zostil, Nitish Sarda, founder SmartWorks, Suresh Rangarajan, founder and CEO Colib, Ankita Seth, co-founder and head of acquisitions and HR, Vista Rooms. I will now request Mr. Tumare to start the session. Over to you, Ms. Mara. Thank you, Pratima, and a very good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you to all for all our participants who've joined us here today morning as we talk about the opportunity in adversity, which is in the shared economy and Particularly uh, today, we have taken upon various uh, opportunities that exist in shared economy today. But before I talk about opportunities, you know, there is a certain trend that has globally become a norm, which is that of a circular economy, which means that no more the economy is going to look very linear, uh, you know, wherein people buy, they use and they dispose. So everything is going to be reused, recycled, and therefore there would be less wastage and more uh, better use of the resources that we have so that more people can use it as um, while it, they being abundant but also reusable and shared. Uh, so today uh, that is one of the reasons why we have kept together this meet for shared economy and we see that there are a multitude of opportunities within shared economy that exist today. So the first one we of course we're touching is on real estate and spaces. Now whether they are hostels, whether they are co-living spaces, whether they are co-working spaces, whether they are hotels, everything is going to look very different in terms of its business model and usage going forward. Now understandably with of course social distancing uh, being the norm today, it's uh, people are uh, uh, today a bit scared and people are today a bit wary of not wanting to use or be in the same space where others are. But I think that's only a short term phenomena as long as this virus will last and will continue to scare us. But once it is over, that is how the uh, sustainability is going to become a very, very important issue, as is going to be how hygienic clean the environments we are there uh, where we go. Going forward, my prediction is that living co-working spaces and uh, luxury villas or hostels is going to be the norm. And uh, right now, in the last few years, what we have seen is uh, the coming of uh, or the building up of these places wherein co-working never used to exist till about five years ago. And today it's a big area to be in. Co-living never used to be. Uh, we used to go to landlords and used to probably sometimes take ding dingy spaces and rent them. That is not going to be a norm anymore. We're going to look for good, clean, hygienic spaces. And value-added services by uh, the co-living players, co-working players is also going to be a big norm that we will see in the times to come. You know, I always give an example that there was a time when brands are built and there is a time when opportunities are created. Now, this is the time post-COVID where we'll see more opportunities being created in co-living and co-working, but also at the same time, big brands being built mm -hmm. on their value systems. Their value systems could be more hygienic uh, spaces that they are providing. It could be more value-added services that they're giving to the customers. It is about being able to go last mile for their customer in order to make sure that the customer feels safe and secure in an environment that he's going. 
understandably the opportunity itself is going to be very large because as everybody all businesses post covid will be downsizing they will look for smaller spaces smaller offices and a lot of them might want to shift into a co-working kind of arrangement instead of actually renting and owning their own offices um in on the other side uh, when it comes to co-living we will find that there will be a big opportunity that will emerge because today companies would want to tie up with co-living spaces in order for to make sure that the workforce that is going to live on rent is able to live in a more cleaner better facility as compared to some other rental facilities that they live in because it's not only vital that they um, you know they have their employees living in good clean working environments it's also about when they come together they have to be more cleaner better environments that all of them can work in uh, so going forward shared economy is going to be the way of life uh, and not just in real estate but it will also be in mobility it will also be in consumer goods that we use everything is going to be in part of a circular economy where things will be reused and recycled uh, so today i'm going to head this very interesting panel and i have some amazing uh, panelists over here Uh, who are going to tell us about what are the future opportunities that today exist in shared economy in the spaces which is real estate so let me start with you nitish um nitish heads uh, smartworks uh, as the founder and co-living has been a norm uh, co-working i'm afraid uh, has been a norm um that has now come into existence and is being largely referred to as the future of work uh, so nitish i understand that short term obviously nobody is using these facilities but in the long term what uh, do you see is the future of co-working and how do you see this model changing from currently the way it has been to make it more safer more sanitized more consistent uh, for the customer in the times to come uh, first of all thank you uh, ritu thank you so much for having me here um i think uh, one of the few things that are going to change significantly in co-working now is uh, um you know as a trend in india what was happening for most of the enterprises and that's the side that we cater to uh, is that a lot of them were looking at consolidation you know uh, when we were talking to most of our clients they were talking about uh, consolidating two to three different locations of theirs and coming up with a 1000 or a 2000 seater in one location and having their headquarters out of there uh, but i think that that has significantly changed the uh, uh, conversation that we've started having lately is more about how can we create multiple offices uh, across different parts of the cities uh, a basically for two things one uh, is so that their employees don't have to travel much uh, you have offices for most of these companies very close to where people live and the second thing is uh, so that you know uh, the, the, there is a business continuity plan whenever something like this happens we have to realize now that um, uh, social distancing is going to be a way of life um uh, uh, all co-working players are going to essentially focus on making sure that uh, the spaces uh, and the services required for social distancing are in place before uh, most of our enterprise clients move in uh, i think how we're going to look at the space is going to be slightly different uh, earlier the conversation used to be how dense can we make the co-working spaces can we fit in one seat in 65 to 70 square foot i think now the conversation is going to go back and say that all right we want certain norms of social distancing to be followed and can we go back to the 80 to 100 square foot per person and sort of intensify move for offices uh, having said that i think the second trend that is that people are talking about is work from home i, I don't think that is going to be a big uh, uh, sort of thing in india uh, because we don't have the infrastructure present so i i am i'm pretty sure people are still going to opt out for co-working uh, as an option because you don't want to really spend on the infrastructure so i think it's a good great opportunity for us uh having said that there are a bunch of norms uh, uh that we have to really they put in place in our spaces for it to be uh, you know usable by our clients hi uh this is saurav so it is just gone offline so i'll just take over for the moment so uh so if i can come surish to you what's your thought how how this space is going to pan out in the you know new future given that uh, you know social distancing uh, is the norm uh, uh, nowadays yeah i think um, we touched upon this in our conversation earlier before we started the session and i think it's very important uh, suddenly people are looking at uh, clean and hygienic people were willing to live in whatever kind of places because residence was not something that was uh, that was a top of the mind priority they because they were all looking at 
you know hostels and paying guest accommodation as a as a stopgap arrangement but now uh, given whatever has happened in the economy over the last couple of months people have started the trending word is clean and safe uh, and hygienic uh, uh, residences which was never there before so i think that is a big evolvement in in terms of a customer and in terms of a tenant's mind from uh, the other point is also about safety because you know in terms of you know in case there are any challenges that uh, people face these are all usually used by migrants people who don't belong to the same city so what happens when you when you are in a strange city and who's your you know who, who's the person who's going to take care of you who's your eyes in case of an emergency anchor in that city that becomes very important because you know we have never come across situations where borders are sealed districts are sealed uh, zones are sealed so who's your friend who's your homey who's your neighborhood friend that has suddenly become a very very important thing so you would don't want to be living on your own you would much rather live in a with a brand uh, which will take care of you and which will also service you in case of these kind of emergencies so this is from a tenant point of view and and i think from a corporate point of view uh, they were always you know wanting to stay at an arms length uh, from a from a, a, a tenant or a, from an employee staying perspective but at this point in time i see that changing because you know uh, co living will automatically become a uh, business continuity plan for many corporates uh, especially in the it bt sector which means that they will be very very uh, interested to figure out where these guys are staying and what kind of infrastructure is available whether internet is available whether you know food is available for them to continue uh, living in such uh, you know uh, uh, lockdown situation so on and so forth so i think that is an evolving thing and that i think uh, people were only interested in dropping them off in whatever be the facility but that will change people will be very interested corporates will be very interested as to what kind of facilities they live in whether that has adequate infrastructure overall uh, 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 you know serving to the needs of the uh, corporate in case of a in case of an emergency is something that we do want uh, one last point that i would like to make is also in general people's confidence level has shaken up uh, so uh, something that everybody will look at is flexibility whether it's in the co working space or co living spaces Uh, whether it's a corporate tenant or a retail tenant everybody is starting to look at uh, flexibility as a very important criteria which means that you don't want to get into a 11 month contract with a land owner from whom deposit recovery will become a, a challenge so you know every, everything will evolve based on that people uh, for the next 6 12 18 months are going to be a little little worried uh, and uh, look at uh, flexibility and pay a premium for uh, flexibility this is something that that will also so so you see this as an opportunity of more collaborations coming in uh, with uh, your kind of model with uh, companies uh, most right yeah one is a collaboration i think this market uh, see co working i think was an innovation uh, but co living uh, in fact co living came after co working but i think it's not an innovation unfortunately i'm saying this despite you know uh, running a brand in co living uh, that's primarily because you know for several centuries people living together uh, people of same tastes and likes and dislikes living together has been a phenomena right migrant uh, labor camps have been a phenomena soldiers living together in trenches have been a phenomena so this is not a extreme innovation but what will happen is from an unorganized it will become organized that is the evolution that is going to happen you will see more brands evolving uh, because housing was always an ego i live i live in you know golf uh, golf share i live in you know prestige uh, uh, apartments i live in farm meadows you know these are the kind of statements people make so that has to fizzle down and start moving into co living spaces as well so uh, the pride of living will start coming in and people will start moving away from you know unorganized to an organized player that's the that's the evolution that will happen okay okay so i'll come to dharamveer and then to ankita so for for co living it's a little different where you have a little permanence in terms of people who are living but in say hostel dharamveer so you know the the churn is much higher so how do you keep that check and balance in terms of you know safety and uh, because there will be a lot of people who will be coming in and now 
uh, with uh, you know even for us asymptomatic people showing uh, signs we don't know where we are heading so what would be the plan for you right so i think uh, i think the first plan is to let's see when the things start getting normal when do when do people start getting outside their homes all right and uh, then when you, you know, as i mentioned a bit earlier as well that the travel is an outcome of a safe and healthy society in which people love to go and explore outside and see so i think you know there's a this larger trend that might mix up you know with uh, because hostel always provides very high quality infrastructure whether it comes to internet or whether you want to just stay there for a couple of weeks and work and uh, it might not just be your office work there are people who are artists several different passions uh, in the economy itself so where i see you know uh, us going forward is that towards those people who wish to take a longer break as well whether it is two weeks whether it is three weeks whether it is a small group of startup you know four or five people who want to go out who want to work let's say from a secluded place since we have these 50 locations all across india so that is something that you know obviously you know we are looking at and uh, really exploring then you know as things open up there is going to be that social distancing norm there is going to be a heavy sanitizing effect there is going to be a mandate mask inside these spaces you know and i think uh, that goes across you know whether you are running a hotel or whether you are running a backpackers hostel so you know i think you know those are the as as you know nitish also mentioned suresh also mentioned i think the product itself you know the product itself that we guys are building has to evolve you know and then there will be a demand out of it you want to travel can you provide me end to end safety that you know that picks me up from home it is definitely you know covid free wherever i go it's all taken care of do i have friends in that spaces wherever i am going is there somebody who i can also you know relate on an inclusive level not just on a brand level i think the brands are also you know changing their positions as we come to the millennials and gen z brands today are much more honest brands today are much more you know approachable friendly you know for the for that matter rather than you know just somebody who is the just uh, let's say a thappa or or some place you know who's running ads in the television for the matter we haven't run a single ad you know but the word of mouth that's how uh, you know the community is right now perceiving the brands so i think there is a product evolution that we are going to do and then let's see how the demand and how how soon or how in in what phase the demand comes what kind of demand usually comes so we have to be on our toes i think it's a fast changing landscape right now but uh, but from that standpoint i think the standard procedures of you know social distancing sanitizing mask mandatory you know, those things might be you know common all across you know be it co working or uh, or co living or even in the hostel spaces yeah. ankita coming to you so for hospitality first of all travel needs to start and then comes you know staying so uh, the path seems even longer but then uh, how do you see uh, uh, what are the changes that are required from business point of view to to ensure that people visit vista rooms yeah so um, see for us uh, earlier it was always a location which was a usp uh, to bring in uh, customers cuz uh, they would have beautiful views nice homes uh, lovely locations but today with the new normal that we all talk about it's going to be hygiene uh, service definitely but hygiene is something which uh, everybody uh, is uh, going to differentiate with and this assurance of hygiene uh, is something that we all need to work on so for us in terms of plans uh, definitely beautiful locations uh, uh, very very uh, exciting for a customer to come in but without the uh, assurance of hygiene it may not work at all so for that uh, our steps are in terms of you know how do you communicate to your customer how do you actually do it at the properties so we're building uh, our all around that uh, where uh, these uh, aspects of uh, you know all all hygiene aspects that one needs to cater to is something uh, most critical for us and how do you make it uh, as we discuss you know brands are being more honest uh, on who stayed what happened what were the temperatures uh, how are our caretakers uh, managing these are factors that we are building in in our current uh, period where it's more of Uh, building the new uh, way of operating i think that's something that will make a difference to us and the other part is privacy which we feel will be a, uh, another usp for uh, you know most uh, of these space spaces is something that we are uh, already working on that how do you make it uh, uh, let's say for example it is important that there is a certain time kept so only 
alternate days are available or you move to long stays so these are different things that we as a brand have been working on and are uh, categorizing our uh, units in that form uh, managing our workforce also on those lines that uh, they are trained a lot of virtual training programs is something that in this period we are working on uh, at the same time uh, the moment things open up there would be uh, certain other trainings that will uh, work out and then there are certifications that uh, are uh, available today uh, with which we are uh, also going to tie up so that consumer assurance uh, and actual assurance of the properties that is the new new way that we are uh, changing ourselves of how we were operating earlier Oh, I'm sure. I, I don't know how difficult will that be to, uh, you know, assure uh, uh, consumers till the time you know it's declared that we are COVID free. But uh, I'll come to you, Nitesh. So, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, co-working spaces, uh, I, I've seen some reports that there have been many cancellations, and uh, and uh, you know, people have been uh, the advance the advance bookings have been coming down. So I'm sure that there needs to be changes in the uh, dimensions of how a co co-working space works from now and then. So does it mean that your spaces will the efficient uh, the efficiency of the spaces in terms of the number of uh, the number of uh, cubicles that you were able to give would come down, and will that affect the revenue uh, as such? So, so um, I, I think in the past uh, couple of months, yes, people have been re revisiting the fact uh, that how densified is their current office setups and how can they de-densify it. Uh, I think the norms will change. It will become from a 65 square foot sort of norm and it will go up to about uh, 85 to 90 at least. Uh, so there's definitely going to be an impact on a perceived cost. Uh, I think when you look at uh, a co-working, the margins of co-working players, um, over the next couple of quarters, yes, we see a significant, we see maybe not a significant hit, but we will definitely take a hit on our margins per seat. Uh, having said that, I think, uh, you know, economically, uh, this is the time where we see this as an opportunity more than anything else. Because, um, you know, in the last uh, couple of weeks, the number of inquiries that have come for co-working space to us have spiked up by almost 60%, even though we're on a close down and we understand decisions aren't being made right now. But the number of inquiries for people who want to take up space, uh, you know, post uh, this being lifted has already gone up by 60%. Uh, on a day-to-day -day average, we're getting more than 100 to 120 inquiries, uh, which is a significant jump of what we were getting earlier. Uh, so there's definitely interest in this space. Yes, margins will go down for a couple of quarters because people would want to be careful till the time the social distancing norms are in place, uh, which, is, which might be a reality for the next uh, two, three quarters. But... Um, um, uh, having said that, you are making your margins from uh, the number of inquiries that are going to come in, which hopefully once we start off, are going to get converted. Uh, specifically for us, we are very, very enterprise focused. So 95% plus of our clients are enterprises. And these enterprises are looking at business continuity also as a solution that they require. Right. So some of the conversations we're having with our uh, clients is, can I get 30 seats in all your 32 centers across India? Um, because we want to give our, uh, our employees the flexibility of working out of wherever they can. Uh, so I think that is the other trend that will come up, uh, which will help us uh, sort of maintain those margins. So, uh, coming sort of, I'll take over. Thank you very much. So I'll take over uh, from here. Um, sorry very much for dropping out uh, in the earlier conversation. Um, so, you know, as uh, Saurabh was just pointing out uh, that, and I think Nitish uh, sort of said that about 30 to 30% 30 uh, of the queries have started coming from enterprises. So, Resh, my question to you is, is this a trend that you are also going to see coming uh, in terms of enterprises now taking over a major chunk of your customer base instead of individuals? Yeah, uh, predominantly co-living uh, as an industry has been a build to uh, consumer, built to tenant directly. Uh, it was a very, very small percentage which was actually uh, built to company directly. So we, uh, we as an example, had less than 10% which was built to company. But I see that uh, trend changing, though it will take a lot of time, 6 to 12 months before it actually settles down uh, and people start adopting this. But uh, uh, we have started a lot of inquiries at this point in time more flirtatious in nature at this point in time where customers, uh, corporate customers are looking at us 
and asking if we can offer them uh, you know beds plus seats in their property in our properties as more as a business continuity plan in fact we had a couple of clients who wanted 1800 beds and seats together in three locations uh, hyderabad pune and bangalore uh, but those kind of vacant inventory is not available with us so we could not service those customers but that's what is the evolution that will happen out of this uh, you know as i mentioned earlier they were least bothered as to where their employees were living but now they will be very very concerned uh, to make sure that the infrastructure is in place not only in the workplace but also in the living spaces sure but do you see this as an opportunity i mean do you think you can uh, now quickly turn around in order to meet this demand that is coming from the market uh, do you feel that you could tie up with a lot of other such uh, co living spaces and be able to meet this kind of corporate demand that is coming yeah so uh, unfortunately what happens is uh, you know this is this has to be long term contracts with the corporates it cannot be short term in nature so like the 1800 bed inquiry that we talked about was a three month only during lockdown so corporates need to settle down and figure out that you know if their employees live closer to their it park it is actually going to be a saving in terms of transportation and of course you know time uh, saving like saving as well so uh, we need to have far more detailed conversations with these corporates but i definitely see this as an opportunity uh, you know in the western world whether it is google facebook or salesforce all of them are creating integrated campuses in the bay area so you will not uh, see this uh, uh, you know beyond the next couple of years where uh, you know many of our corporates will also start looking at an integrated campus which means that at least in the same micro market if if you are operating a large facility in a white field or an outer ring road or a uh, you know karadi you will you will want your uh, employees to stay in the same micro market and prefer to walk to work because today you know taking public transportation also is going to come under a little, little bit of threat over the next few days uh, based on the social distancing norms i think she's uh, gone off again so and i'll can so uh, yeah of course i mean uh, this this will have to be we'll have to see how it goes from here so uh, uh, that will be uh, how uh, uh, how about you so uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know the flow of uh, customers that will come to you and uh, do you see this uh, uh, how do you uh, i mean will it change in terms of how people were uh, in terms of uh, units that you were having so will it also mean that you will also have to uh, give more space and which will mean that your revenues will come down how do you see it how you are you planning it yeah so so i'll answer that and i also continue on our larger discussion of the panel you know as suresh rightly said you know we have to i think you know we have to really look at it from a as as a infrastructure perspective we don't have you know a lot of large buildings that have been made with the mindset of you know people living in in small private spaces you know small private spaces is fundamentally different than let's say what the real estate builders have you know largely built you know we all talk about you know the crash that's happening in the market right now but we must remember it all began with the real estate prices you know the larger real estate inflated market that was already there in the market you know and uh, i think you know when when the larger trend is now towards you know there were higher prices that were bought but the rental yields weren't there you know for a lot of these properties the rental yields were very less you know in india a lot of rental rates are close to 1 to 2% so you know to really build a a high quality infrastructure that can even generate 4 to 6% yield you know a sudden shock that has really now come into the market right now is a great time you know a lot of people you know come to us and say that you know we have these let's say 500 uh, hostel room that we had made can we work it out with you guys and i really look at those properties but those are already half made you know they already have those Uh, a kitchen inside every 3 bhk so if you have already designed a building with let's say 4 3 bhks and now you want to convert it into a co-living is fundamentally very different you know you don't come up with that high quality product that can be there you know when you look at those you know 200 square feet rooms you know shrinking to 120 square feet you know the way it used to be let's say in the top tier colleges in india or across you know in the, in our iit i am we had those small rooms with us that were private you know i think 
when you look at co-living market and you know when you mix it up with a larger lifestyle of a circular economy let's say you know let's say we have a lot of volunteers a lot of property managers who actually you know uh, although property managers get paid but a lot of volunteers are unpaid the only thing that they get is a bed to sleep uh, you know a great hospitality you know people to serve the people to meet and food to eat you know so if you know if companies come up with that perspective that you know we need such an infrastructure in which people can live they can have fast internet they can have a fast work so then you know then it automatically transforms into you know because we are those who you know the, all of the people who are talking about right now our expertise lies in creating these spaces and there are you know in the ecosystem there is from government to you know corporates to these developers who you know create these infrastructure spaces everybody has to you know understand where the world is moving forward you know you cannot just you know request 2000 seats or 2000 beds for two months and then move out you know there has to be a fundamental shift and a long term approach you know towards where we are heading towards you know it has to be in half a decade or a, let's say a decade long perspective from here where i see you know there's a very large co living buildings you know rather than you know rather than just having a prestige or or a golf course road you know where are those buildings that are much more millennium friendly you know that that really do not are you know placing bans on you know there's only uh, families are only allowed in this society you know that that's not how you know i see the world moving forward and you know when i look at zostal and the spaces that we are creating all across india you know so we have gone to very remote places you know from the highest you know in 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 india to the to the first village from uh, spiti to you know in, in kerala and everywhere and and what we have created over there is for people to come to stay to work and you know and 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 i, and I very proudly say to work because what we have also realized you know and and although we come from a real estate perspective and we all want you know things to go back to normal people you know rushing to offices you know people rushing to you know away from their home but the stark reality is there are a lot of new job opportunities that are going to be created that are going to be work from home there are going to be you know uh, 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 the new norm might be that you know we might take half the co working seats that we had because half the time people might just be working from home you know so these are the realities and that then automatically it transforms so i think a very good internet and a very good clean and hygienic infrastructure might just be the bare essentials to really kick off real estate in places that wasn't anywhere the real estate prices have you know very uh, secluded to let's say you know being city centers and even inside a inside in, inside india you know it's just the gurgaon or the or the bombay banda regions or the bangalore that have been seeing you know even sharp peak where the where the larger real estate market in india has been in a downfall i think this is a great time for you know really great spaces to be created across tier 2 cities beyond location you know rating a place that this is the price per square feet only because of location has to fundamentally change we have to look at the infrastructure that the place has and that infrastructure demands a premium it's as simple as that and beyond that infrastructure is the service layer if your service layer is you know once again of, of a very high quality you will demand higher yield so i think uh, you know i think the market itself will put pressure on 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 a lot of a lot of these things but uh, let's see how how it turns around okay ankita your final thoughts before we move on to a uh, question and answer we have a lot of question and and answers that have got through that yeah so in terms of opportunity uh, you know in our space because uh, it is uh, private homes uh, so it automatically takes care of social distancing uh, only the known group is there uh, definitely we see a good opportunity there uh, otherwise in terms of a shift as i said you know location to um, hygiene uh, service to again hygiene this is something that one needs to look at and that is what creates the way further okay thank you so much so uh, we have uh, some interesting questions uh, that uh, we have lined up so um, uh, the first question i think we we're going to pick is uh, ashutosh sir uh, can we have uh, him uh, can he, can we have his video uh, audio please uh, hello everyone hi ashutosh uh my question is for mr nitesh sharda uh i uh, basically i have three question the first of the question is that how do you see the future of large size spaces versus the optimum size with more number of offices across different location in a city for our co working industry um i think uh, to answer that there is everyone has their own strategy when it comes to co working we as a strategy uh, do much larger setups we don't do uh 20 30 40000 square foot offices uh, typical size we do only individual buildings 
and typical size of our buildings are anywhere between 200 to 300000 square foot in fact some of our other properties are about 800000 square foot so we do much larger setups uh, having said that we also design our offices as private offices uh, for our enterprises so uh, essentially inside the office it's completely custom made for our clients uh, so that's why we can densify or densify it as much as the client's preference the trend that we are seeing for our clients is uh, um uh, you know to my point which i said earlier is that people are now densifying their uh, existing setups and they are saying that instead of having one um you know sort of consolidated setup we want multiple offices spread across different regions uh, so if someone was looking at 1000 seats in one location now they're looking at 300 seats spread across three to four locations uh, that's just how the trend is changing so while the sizes of our facilities are pretty much going to be the way uh, we've been targeting but i think the client spaces are going to get uh, sort of smaller but then they're going to spread across geographies to multiple locations so in terms of total number of seats i think yeah uh, there'll definitely be a spike but it'll be spread across multiple locations does that answer your question uh yes i'm sure nitesh thank you so much uh next question that we have is from abdul uh can we have the audio of abdul please okay i think uh, uh we've not uh, uh, we've lost uh, abdul so next question is from uh anu chipper can we have uh, her uh, audio please Okay the next question i think uh, is from Ishank Ahuja Can we have Ishank please I'm um, there so, uh, I had asked two questions but i've already received the answers on um, um, the panel but i'll go ahead and ask them this was for Ankita and Dharam So, do you think travelers will prefer more secluded places to travel rather than popular crowded cities or hill stations? And Dharambir has already answered that. Uh, maybe we can hear it from Ankita. That is possible. Yeah, Ishank, we definitely see that as a uh, changing trend where people want to uh, going in line with this whole distancing and not uh, really confident on who who was there and so on. uh definitely people want more private spaces more secluded spaces with people who are known to them and uh, the whole uh, place to themselves uh, that is the trend uh, we definitely see uh, coming in mm -hmm. all right and uh, the second question was uh, do you think people would be willing to pay more to get a more private and sp safe space than what they used to earlier uh, this will also hold true for co working co living and also ankita and dharambir yeah so you know i think safety will trump all you know as i as i as i said you know you asked over there as well i think you know when we travel you know when do things get popular you know in fact originally everything is unexplored you know i come from that mindset that india has europe's whole potential but it is all unexplored we need infrastructure we need the infrastructure people will travel it's as simple as that and when things get popular then they get crowded so i think it's it's a very nice time that you know places are healing which were overcrowded and uh, definitely you know i see clearly a security premium either people will not travel there might be a you know two categories of people firstly there will be deal hunters you know who will think that you know now that things are opening up the flights are cheap even you know a recent friend of mine went to south africa and he was staying alone in a five star hotel at a very affordable rate you know so so all i'm saying is there might be some deal hunters that might come up first as the lockdown opens up but the normal traveler will be very willing to pay you know 100 bucks extra so at hostel if you will compare the hostel to any other backpackers hostel chain you know all of those uh, rate parity etc what people do we never do that we we have always priced ourselves at a let's say 500 bucks or something above it usually and uh, and it's always stand for hygienic secure uh, you know very convenient location so i think that just we might have to you know invest more 
in sanitizers in masks etc for everybody so we will have to you know push it back you know towards the consumers as well and uh, hopefully the larger thing is that we have got what the consumers want i think the consumers themselves will want to spend you know 50 bucks more and you know be that safe secure not just for themselves but as we cater to a lot of young travelers over here they need to give safety and assurance to their family members also so i think uh, from my side i think you know definitely security and safety will be a, a bit more clear in my opinion okay thank you dhamri uh, we can take one more question i think suresh she would want to answer this question from shail sir she said uh, she said as people will now prefer to travel less and avoid public transport how can one look at an opportunity for combination of uh, co living and co working spaces yeah um, i think this is uh, something very interesting that is going to evolve co working spaces uh, including you know common co working spaces within the co living spaces could become a trend uh giving them desk within their uh, within their bedroom spaces could be the other one uh, which will evolve in terms of the designs that we come up with but most importantly i think uh, there'll be a hopefully there'll be a lot of cut down in terms of zigzag travel that this uh, uh, all the urban cities are seeing people would prefer to stay closer to workplaces uh, than ever before they will want to you know uh, uh, probably hopefully start work, walking to work uh because uh, the perception is going to be that you know public transportation is going to be unsafe at least for the near future uh i hope they don't start and also you know people are scared to get into a uber and a ola and you know uh, uh, sharing a ride on a bike with others so with all these norms coming in and coming becoming a way of life uh what <clears throat> living closer to workplaces will become very very attractive so uh, one of the questions was also to see whether temporarily there'll be a, a rise in prices of real estate especially housing real estate around it parks i think yes uh, you know so people who have inventory which is uh, whether it is co living inventory or residential inventory in and around office spaces in it hubs will start commanding a premium uh, when they offer flexibility okay okay uh this one uh, last question for uh, nitesh and very quickly if you can uh, uh, so we have a question saying considering slow down and industry uh, is looking at consolidation uh, are you still looking at acquisitions and uh, expansion plans absolutely i think um, you know at this point of the year when we started off the year we were at uh, about 2 and a half million square foot we were looking at expanding to about 5 million square foot obviously there's a slight correction to what we were looking at i think by the end of this year we'll still be at 5 million we're already 4.2 million square foot uh, having said that the inorganic growth is uh, is the other opportunity that we think there is there for us in the market uh, there are couple of players that we're already evaluating in terms of acquisitions i think that is going to be a significant uh, a uh, portion of growth for some of the co-working players because there are over 400 co-working players in india today and consolidation uh is going to be the way forward uh because uh, like minded players will come together and since uh, you know at this point of time you really need to uh, sort of uh, hold on to your cash flows and make sure um, you know you, you're in the green which we are for the past two years uh we growing in organically might uh, make sense so acquisition is something that we are actively looking after okay okay uh, uh there is one more question uh, which uh, i i think uh, maybe the uh, ranveer and uh, suresh can answer what is the ideal distance of uh, paying guest or co living space must exist from a uh, tech park uh as i said you know uh, for these are youngsters uh, people who typically use these work space uh, i mean living spaces are between the age group of 22 to 32 so uh, a, a couple of kilometers is still good uh, so you know 2 kilometers which is uh, probably a 15 minute walk is something that people will still prefer uh, but the closer they are uh, from one of the gates uh, the better it is uh, so i think uh, that will become the trend and again you know uh paying guest accommodations which are uh, uh, unorganized will see a lot of fallout and become organized uh because you know we also have a rental housing association now where we are specifying certain norms as to how we maintain these properties to ensure that you uh follow all the protocols in terms of cleaning and hygiene and garbage disposal so these are being mandated by the local authorities and that will become very very essential 
so uh, ideally 2 kilometers is the is the uh, radius i would say from any of the uh, it park gates uh, so uh, we really run out of time for, for the next uh, we have people uh, waiting for the next session so thank you so much everyone uh, it was great to uh, hear from everyone uh, what i understand is that while these are very challenging times there are definitely opportunities that have come up and uh, together i'm sure that uh, we shall uh, uh, you know uh, this time shall also also pass and then uh, we'll have uh, you know everything back on track so thank you uh, thank you uh, very much everyone uh, one next session uh, can i uh, give it back to pritima please thanks all of thanks nitu thank, thank you thank you so much sir sir so anketa nice catch up thank you panelists i think it was a fantastic session uh, moving on to our next session which is on the mobility space this session is for about 35 minutes followed by question and answers for 10 minutes our panelists for this session are mr amit gupta co-founder and ceo yulu mr rajiv suri managing partner oris venture capital lakshna jha ceo and co-founder s right akash gupta co-founder and ceo zip Our moderator for this session is Saurabh Kumar, editor, Special Projects Entrepreneur India. Uh, I see all our panelists have joined, so over to you, Saurabh. Uh, thank you so much, Pratima. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to the second section of today's webinar on uh, uh, the future of shared economy. Uh, in this session, we will look at possibly one of the most critical aspects of. Uh, shared economy and that is mobility where shared mobility is uh, one of the most uh, pronounced disruptions uh, to have happened and it shook the entire uh, concept of vehicle ownership uh, because of its ease uh, according to a study the fleet strength of shared mobility market is expected to grow at a cagr of around 9.7% between uh, 2019 and 2025 in india Uh, mind you, this is on top of almost 50% uh, growth in fleet strength in 2018 compared with a year ago period. Also, the revenue uh, was expected to be around 14% CAGR up to uh, 2025. But with the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, these uh, services have come to a, a screeching halt, and the road ahead looks a little unpredictable right now. Uh, so today we will look at how this space is going to pan out in the future with the help of our esteemed uh, panelists today, uh, who are all stakeholders in the uh, uh, shared mobility space. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. So uh, let us start with a very crucial question: shared and social distance. These are two poles apart. So what does it entail for mobility? So, uh, Lakshana, if we can, if I can start with you, please. You'll have to unmute. Hi. Ah, uh, thanks, Arav. Thanks for having us here. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate. So, ah, uh, yes, you rightly said that post-COVID, social distancing is, ah, uh, you know, is going to be a new phenomena. People are going to be very aware of it. Now, having said that, uh, people also have to commute, right? uh businesses are badly impacted economy is badly impacted and for that to you know get better people will have to start getting to work now um, a large percentage of the people use public transportation and cabs and taxis that's almost around uh, 50% plus so um considering that uh, you know in this at this point people are you also said that you know like people are very scared to uh, you know travel having said that uh, you know um people are more comfortable traveling with the people that they know they are not comfortable traveling with strangers in public transportation or in cabs because we don't know you know who sat in those uh, you know a little bit ahead of time right so having said that uh, uh, uh so having said that uh, you know people are more and that's where carpooling play a big role post covid so uh, people are comfortable in carpooling uh, 70% of our uh, carpools are done with people who travel repetitively with the same groups so people are comfortable traveling with uh, people from their society people from their organization so at this point of time people are very aware of you know what is happening in my society what is happening in the next society and there are no uh, positive or negative you know, positive cases right 
so uh, people are very comfortable traveling with the people from the same society people from the same company um, even in the last 4 5 weeks we have seen that our uh, co riders have been touch with each other uh, because they become friends right when they start traveling with each other keeping in touch making sure that their friends on the platform are doing well so post covid uh, we think that people will travel in smaller groups with people that they know uh, the network that they trust versus traveling in public transportation and cabs um, where they have to travel with strangers or they do not know who sat in the cabs or cars before them okay okay thank you thank you lakshna so amit i'll come to you so uh, lakshna said that uh, you know people are comfortable traveling with people whom they know rather than you know unknown people so in your kind of model where the product itself can be shared with a lot of people so how do you see that there uh, you know the attitude of people in using uh, those things sure so thanks for once again uh, i think there's a spectrum there's no one good answer having our own vehicle is probably the safest mode because you're not worried about uh, being infected by anyone but as we all of us know that uh, that's not a luxury as a as a country we have so two things first of all uh, economic reason people cannot afford uh, on on their own uh, even two wheeler penetration in india is around 20% 80% of our country does not have any any vehicle whatsoever second thing even if we basically are rich we can afford a vehicle our road space does not basically is geared for that mm-hmm. whatever we you cut it we have to rely on uh, shared mobility or mobility as a service now each one of us uh, will be making adjustments uh, the way we have been so if i am a consumer i will be worried about uh, going in a group so that's why worldwide public transportation take, has taken a hit already and wherever the cities where they are reviving back they are basically now putting uh, structures around that okay 50% of the seats will be used there will be space etc and then uh, as far as yulu is concerned we are a single passenger vehicle so we are not worried about social distancing uh, in fact we probably are the safest mode out there if someone really has to use a medium which is not theirs we probably are the safest uh, model out there other good advantage with our vehicle is because we use electric mobility and we have a high frequency of uh, vehicle being uh, swapped for battery so what we have done we have added a new process where our vehicles are being disinfected so now on our app we are showing that when was the last time this vehicle was disinfected uh, to an extent that if it is more than 24 hours you cannot open the vehicle so we are taking extreme measures uh, a uh, one more good part about our business model is you know we are using below 25 km per hour speed vehicle which means that we don't need to have helmets and i think helmet will be a big problem uh, in post covid so we are uh, there's no second person there's no shared helmet and then on top of it we are basically making sure the vehicles are being disinfected along with the customer execution so in a spectrum we think that anything which is kind of mobility as a service services like ours would be the safest one out there okay akash your view uh, your views on that hi uh, so hello everyone uh, thanks for having me here uh, so one of the things that i feel uh, for shared mobility which could impact uh, at least in the short term is uh, that we've been the first and last mile providers and what we need to realize is uh, that uh, the the metro usage and the bus usage uh, you know could reduce a little and then last mile uh, the solution that uh, you know we designed for shared mobility you know for 2 3 kilometers might have a limited impact you know till the time those services are not back in full action like a delhi metro or a you know bus service in bangalore or hyderabad uh, or ahmedabad right so those are the things that that we need to be watchful of at the same time one of the key things that might happen being shared mobility versus a bike taxi or a pooled cab is that here at least you know you are riding the vehicle on your own and even by uh, ensuring that the company is disinfecting those vehicles and you also take your precautions by applying masks and uh, you know uh, gloves i think this could be a shift that a lot of people might want to keep the vehicle with them 
for a longer duration rather than just take it for 15 minutes or a 30 minute ride which is why we focused quite a lot on the long rental plans you know which could be you know a day or a week or a month or a quarter uh, so you keep the vehicle because people will not be looking at buying a lot of these vehicles immediately but they they might want to still uh, have a vehicle with them for their personal mobility needs going to office from their homes and uh, that's that's a limited shift that i see us doing along with the sanitization which is which is one of the most important things right now uh, but but one thing that i have seen in um, you know other geographies like china which has opened up there the usage of uh, this shared cycles which which has been the biggest thing in china has again you know picked up quite a lot in fact there's a that's the only medium along with personal cars which has grown um, you know almost like uh, 20 30% so I think uh, it's it's uh, there, but all of us uh, need to take the key precautions that we are. Okay, okay. Uh, Rajiv, I'll come to you from uh, from you know the, your lens would be completely different from uh, the other three here. So you know, on one hand, it is very scary. Uh, you know, it, it might sound scary that uh, uh, you will have to share uh, uh, space with someone. Uh, so, but on the other hand, with layoffs, salary cuts, and uncertainty, even people if uh, uh, they want uh, to buy private vehicles a lot, as uh, just was said, that they may not be able to uh, buy them. So now comparatively, shared mobility is still better than public transport, I would believe, when it comes to social distancing. So as, a, as an investor, how do you analyze the situation? Uh, how do you see it? And how do you see uh, uh, investors reacting to this when it comes to uh, putting in money to this space? You'll have to unmute it. Oh, one always does this, doesn't one? You know, this muting, unmuting is <laughs> a, a part of our lives now. Thank you for um, you know, for this chat and the conversation. Very timely topic. Um, I, I think, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty at this point in time around in terms of what this corona thing actually is. Obviously, the short-term impacts are very clearly felt by everybody, but the medium to long-term is still a little bit more uncertain, in part because we don't know enough about what's happening, uh, despite all the information overload that we're getting right now. And uh, in part, we don't know how the behavior change will be. See, we are working in a recursive system right now, where the I'm sure you remember earlier physics where the act of observation changes the observed, right? So the act of um, absorbing more and more information about COVID and other things also changes the behavior in the consumer. And that consumer behavior change has to be something that you have to respond to. And that's an ever moving target, right? So that I think is a big challenge that we face at the moment. Now with that uncertainty in mind, I think there are three or four categories that I would sort of split the, uh, split the actions or reactions into, right? The first category is basically around, uh, you know, the loss of revenue and the additional costs that go along with it, right? So obviously that, how, how this is going to pan out is there's going to be lesser number of people that are going to be taking it for whatever reasons. And um, you know, one part of it is that in terms of revenue loss. And the second part of it is around the cost of that revenue loss, right? More fumigation, more services, more protection for drivers and so on and so forth. So that's one part of it, right? The second one I would say is behavior change that's coming out of uh, COVID, right? So if you think about uh, um, India being, uh, you know, cash on delivery ecosystem per se, right? Would this sort of translate to more wallets being used because I really don't want to hand over cash so the driver doesn't want to take the cash, right? So uh, could that mean behavior change? You know, public transport buses now in most Western world are not accepting, uh, you know, payments in the bus, you know, and uh, they're not allowing people to board from the front also. They are, they, are, they are asking them to board from the back, right? So that's the second category where there is, um, there is change coming about in behavior. That's the second one, right? And the third one, and this perhaps is the most important thing, is what are the human impact of uh, such things, right? You now have, as I was saying earlier, you know, something like six, seven lakh uh, drivers in, you know, eight, nine lakh drivers in the Ola Uber ecosystem. And then you've got a lot of people that are out there in the market, all of who belong to the so-called gig economy. The good part of the gig economy is that the PNLs don't have to take the liability of those people, but, but the bad part is they are left out in the lurch, right? So what does that mean to them? You know, how will they cope with the, the dramatic loss of their fortunes in the recent past? And how will things pan out for them? For instance, some of our startups have taken coach. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I a little think... bit. So there's a lot of this human element that we are still yet to figure out. And to my mind, that's an equal and a more valid part of how the story will pan out. How will those people that are affected the most and that do not have the kind of cushion and resources that we folks have, how are they going to take it? To my mind, these are the three components that I would sort of split the reaction into. So in terms of business continuity, do you think it will be more difficult for the asset-heavy players uh, because they have debt to retire and that, that revenue has come? To zero compared with uh, uh, mobility players who have uh, assets who are, who are asset light or their models are asset light. So, I mean, I think this is as I was telling you, we are living in a recurrence. New input is changing the behavior of the, uh, you know, that's uncertainty in terms of how this. No, right? I, I don't really know. Let us assume two scenarios. I, I don't know whether you've been, I'm sure if you've been catching the catching the, the news that's happening on COVID. In the last couple of days, Frank Cuomo, the governor of New York, came out and articulated a study which basically showed that 15% of New Yorkers are already um, having the antibody in their, in their system, right? New York has got two crore people, 20 million people, which essentially means 3 million people are affected. But the actual number of people that died in that um, in the city so far is about 15, 16,000, which points to a 0.4 to 0.5 death rate, right? Which is much closer to the flu as compared to the, the nasty 5% that we hear about when it comes to COVID. The reason I bring out the statistic is to talk about the fact that is COVID something that's a game changer in terms of a disease or is it going to revert back to the flu, right? If that, that and the panic associated with that will have a huge difference in terms of consumers, consumers' behavior, right? And if consumer behavior is going to revert towards more like a flu, then it will be business as usual. Not too many things will change. If on the other hand, there's going to be a dramatic change in perception because of the fact that COVID behaves very differently and we need to change our behavior, then you're going to see a lot of changes, right? To that extent, I would say you have to be a little bit more in the wait and watch mode right now, rather than making drastic or dramatic changes to how your business model is going to pan out. Because the reality as it pans out, we don't quite know yet. I hope that answered the question. Yes. So it was in a little bit of a, you know, perhaps yeah, I know. So, show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, we are all uncertain that how things are going to be. But it's just that, you know, a lot of people have their uh, debt repayment uh, uh, obligations right now. And we're not sure that how it's going to be. So so I'm sure it uh, uh, depends from player to player. So Amit, if I can come to you and uh, ask your views on, you know, you you don't have, like, you have your own smaller vehicles, but you, ha you have your own. But there are, like Lakshana, they have like a pooling system, they do not have assets. So what difference does it make in this kind of a situation for these two kind of models? Sure. See, I think having an asset light model is certainly better. It gives you flexibility uh, and that's why it is loved by uh, investors. Yeah. At the same time, I believe that uh, there are businesses uh, which cannot be built, uh, at least in the, in the, in the beginning, on that philosophy because someone has to put in models someone has to put in money and uh, at least uh, what we are doing right now as we speak uh, we have used our own capital raised through equity means to buy those vehicle prove a business model and then in steady state have some large company to put in money or put an asset on lease financing and again we become an asset light so at the stage of the company we are in we are like an asset heavy company but that's not the steady state picture. Uh, I think it's just a risk and reward at the end of the day. Uh, and what's happening right now in the world is, I don't think so we should extrapolate it beyond a point because those are not business as usual because if that's a phenomena, I think 99% of the companies will cease to exist. So I don't want to uh, just change the strategy because of this. Uh, so, so for example, in our case, we decided not to use petrol diminished scooters because we knew that uh, the unit economics uh, will be horrible. And not only that, there's no path to make them better. Whereas with EV, we had a ray of hope that we will make a strong business case and solving for traffic and air pollution both. And yes, we knew that banks will not uh, understand this particular product. So we have to go through this hardship, create a business model, prove unit economics metrics, and then go to bank in second stage 
to ask for debt and then lease financing. So I think we continue to maintain that. And I think uh, it's okay for some of the entrepreneurs to take a longer path and riskier path, at least from a financing perspective. But uh, if we create an ecosystem because of that risk, I think it's totally worth it. Akash, I'll come to you. So uh, as Amit said that, you know, uh, uh, we should not, and also Rajiv also said that, you know, we should not look too much into it and change the model right away. But, uh, you know, do we, do we see more collaborative approach going forward and evolve? Like for instance, Zip, you, start, you have a grocery delivery also right now on your platform. So, so do we see that kind of approach to come? Because this is the, possibly the first time uh, startups have seen this kind of, so they would feel ready for maybe for the future. So is that the way forward? Well, definitely. I think this is, this is one of the best times for a lot of startups to think of newer opportunities and also um, start up maybe in, in a new form. Uh, if, if someone would want to start up, I would say that this could also be an opportunity to find uh, various things that can be done. Well, at Zip, we've, we've uh, always, you know, tried to create a business model, which at the end of the day leads to profitability or leads to the better unit economics at some point in time. Uh, and, and we've always tried to pivot as a company whenever we uh, looked at the matrix every three to six months and we see that this is a new, you know, thing which is growing on its own. Let's focus our energies more onto that. And I think we've been into, you know, this grocery delivery and food delivery over the last, uh, you know, six to nine months. Uh, definitely that has picked up a huge steam over the last uh, one month where while we were serving three to four partners, now we're serving almost 20 partners, uh, you know, delivering goods for them, medicines for them and groceries uh, along with food, which has always, uh, you know, remained a mainstay. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as Amit pointed out, uh, you know, asset heavy versus asset light. Uh, one of the advantages, uh, and and I would say not, I would not call it an advantage, but uh, a collaborative effort that we have seen at least at our end is that since this is a time which had never, you know, envisaged, nobody had envisaged that, and and uh, and uh, and uh, you know, this is unprecedented. So people have come forward to support, uh, you know, uh, the leases or the rentals that, uh, that we had to pay. We, we uh, don't have any asset on our books uh, and uh, what we went to our lenders or people or investors who own these assets, we went back to them and asked for a kind of a moratorium that while we had a 24 or 36 month uh, you know, lease with them, we asked that let's continue that, but let's give a one month you know, break in that. We will extend the period you know, towards the end of 36 month, make it 37 month. But uh, but let's let's give a one month break if if you can, and positively um, you know in for the vehicles which are not being used uh, you know some of the vehicles get used for B two C some of the vehicles get used for long rentals, only the vehicles which were primarily for the last mile mobility sector we took uh, you know this help from our investors and they were you know kind enough to give us that leeway that sure um, you know these are unprecedented times and RBI has given us a moratorium to those um, you know leases to them also so so that's that helped a little bit um, uh, like office rentals you know thankfully some of the office company uh, you know the our, our office rental also uh, they were happy to give us some kind of a waiver for for this period of lockdown and and that's what collaboration is all about i think and and uh, a lot of startups are coming forward to support uh, insurance, you know, was one thing that we looked at for all our employees. And thankfully, you know, there were insurance startups, which, which could give a COVID insurance and, um, you know, at a good price to all of our employees. Uh, yes, uh, I think that's uh, uh, emerging as a new trend, you know, and how we can collaborate. I see Dunzo doing a very good marketing where they're promoting all the four, you know, five competitors together that we are all, you know, in this and, you know, supporting each other. Okay, all right. So, uh, Rajiv, I'll again come back to you once more. So, so uh, would you also, uh, like, I, I understand you said that, you know, uh, right now we should not read too much into it. And, but still going forward, would it be uh, like people who have just one sort of one vertical of servicing, is that going to be a, a hit with the investors or people who have multiple who show that if not this, we cannot, we have this. If not, so usually people do not dilute it because they want to remain focused, but situations like these may demand that. So how do you see that? So um, 
just a, just an additional point. I'll come to your point, sort of about uh, whether one line of service makes more sense, a multiple lines of service make more sense, right? Obviously, uh, the logical argument to make is always that the multiple lines do, but it's not quite as simple as that. But if I were to go back to the question that is being asked, you know, what does really change at the end of this and going forward, right? The one thing that I think that changes right now is the notion of leverage, right? So until now, you know, for entrepreneurs typically, you know, the money coming in was either coming in as equity money or leverage money or venture debt or some other money, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, the entrepreneur perhaps did not think too much about what kind of money they were holding in their kitties, you know, how much of it was not in their PNL, so on and so forth. Generally, technology-based stories have always been a little asset light. So I'm assuming that asset light is a given for pretty much any, any of the conversations that we have right now, particularly anything that's venture capital funding. Because if it's asset heavy, then venture capital really cannot, uh, you know, fund that because it becomes a much different story. Uh, that's more private equity and other kind of place that you would typically have that. That said, though, the problem with leverage is basically this. You always have liabilities of cash going. What do I mean by leverage? It's basically what you said, sort of. It is the loans that you have. It is the payments that you have to make. It's the rentals that you have to give out. It is the EMIs that you have to give. You know, all those things fit into regular cash outs that have to go out regardless of what the cash in is, right? Those are always a little messy because when you suddenly have dips or blips, then you suddenly need some people to come and save you, give you the moratoriums, give you those kinds of things, right? So leverage is something that I think uh, entrepreneurs will now need to start watching a lot more than they did earlier, right? So if I were an entrepreneur, I would say, right? I'm getting it from venture capital. I'm getting it from XYZ companies. I'm getting it from venture debt. I might get it from my suppliers also. I might get it from my, you know, negative working capital. I have all these options. All of a sudden now I have to very, very be very careful about where that leverage notion is coming from. I have to be a lot more careful about that. That That is one point that I think changes going forward, regardless of what happens in terms of outcomes to COVID, right? That's one thing that I think is important. We are going to definitely watch for that uh, going forward with our startups in terms of what we're doing. Um, on, in terms of the multiple services versus single service lines, as a guiding principle, I think multiple service lines make more sense because obviously you have a little bit of uh, de-risking you know, in terms of uh, in terms of the service lines, in terms of what happens. But the big question there is, you know, are you in multiple businesses at the same time? That I think is a big question that you have to answer, right? If it is multiple, let me put it this way. I've, I started my career with Colgate from Oliver a very long time ago, right? Multiple services could be two different variants of toothpaste, or it could be toothpaste and hair oil, right? They are not quite the same, if you understand what I mean. Right. So selling multiple services, which sort of look similar or the consumer behavior is very same or the kind of consumers you're targeting works for you or the brand is also pretty much aligned with that. That makes sense. But if you're going to look at multiple services that look like completely different businesses, then that becomes a little bit of a distraction for the founders. Right. And the reason why that matters more in a startup as compared to large corporation is that large corporations can afford to have more people concentrating and focusing on their on multiple services and products. But if you're a startup, you've got one founder, he's got very finite amount or she has got very finite amount of time. Um, available to her, what does she do? She has to have a priority absolutely razor shop focused. And if she starts targeting or he starts targeting multiple services, then it becomes a little bit of a distraction. So to that extent, I think uh, there is a nuance there that one needs to consider. Okay, okay. thank you. That, 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 uh, that makes it. Uh, Lakshana, I'll come to you. What's your thought on this? I mean, you are a, uh, you have an asset life model. You do not have a, a very asset, but uh, still, and but you have one segment that you you would do it so how do you see uh, your kind of uh, model evolving from uh, from these kind of situations sure so sort of we totally believe in asset line model uh, you know and we're very passionate about it if you look at 90 percent of the people globally uh, you know including india they were traveling you know uh, with single person in the car and uh, so you know for us we said okay we'll focus on the utilization and we'll connect the people who are going from the same societies so to the same companies. And uh, rather than increasing the traffic on the road, let's put uh, four people together in the car and they can carpool. Um, so, and obviously it's very cost effective also from a people perspective, right? Um, with, uh, with different benefits of saving cost and reducing the congestion on the roads. Um, yes, we are, uh, you know, as of now, we are kind of, uh, you know, single revenue model. But also, I think this is a very temporary phase. It's not like this would continue for the next, you know, six months, a year. And 
right from day one um, in the history of Estrite, we've been very, very, you know, we have we have worked on a very, you know, low cost model. We even today we are only a team of thirty people, while you know startups of our size are anywhere from hundred to two hundred people, right? So we've always, you know, run this in this in a very different way. Most startups don't think like that. And that definitely comes, you know, is very helpful in th these times where everybody else is, you know, laying off people, you know, we're very focused on what we're doing. Focus, uh, like Rajiv said, has been always uh, one point for us. While we, you know, we have single model, um, you know, revenue at this point of time, we always had a belief that we will start with carpooling. Uh, we will always be in mobility. We'll, we'll start with carpooling, but we can easily expand to other asset line models in, in the same area. And that's that's what we have been thinking in the past like few quarters. And again, you know, these times, crisis always brings the best of people. I personally believe. And in these times, we are thinking, okay, how can we add value to our users? That's the most important thing, right? Uh, it's not like you can just say, okay, we want different lines of businesses because we want it, right? What what will add value to the users? And that's what uh, you know we are focusing at this point of time and see if we can expand in the same field of mobility. Um, but again, this is a very temporary solution. I, uh, you know, temporary um, problem that we have, and you know, we can easily get through these difficult times. Okay. So just one uh, part, uh, last question for all of you, and then you can move to uh, question and answer from our uh, attendees. So, uh, what would be the most important thing that is required from for the shared mobility space to gain confidence of the users right now? If I can start with you, Lakshman, and then to others. Yeah, so I think at this point of time, uh, what we've been already doing is over the last few uh, weeks, while you know, people were not traveling, we were communicating safety, uh, you know, tips to them while they were at home, uh, you know, uh, what to do, whether they were going out, whether, you know, making sure people are taking this seriously, not going out. And we will continue that with, we have built some safety features in our platform and people start commuting. And uh, we have been talking also serving a lot of our uh, car owners and our riders to see how they feel about it. And um, what we have seen is, you know, riders are obviously very comfortable because, you know, a lot of them, were, instead of using other means of transportation, they prefer to use carpooling. Uh, even car owners are saying, like I said before, that uh, they are comfortable going with their friends, people from their society. So continuously, you know, also telling them that, you know, what are the uh, safety uh, steps they can take? Like, you know, I think wearing a mask for the next, as people start commuting, people start going out, wearing a mask will be like, uh, you, you know, we'll see 90% of the people doing that, even if people step out to do grocery. So uh, giving them tips like, you know, wearing the mask when they are carpooling, bringing sanitizers, washing hands as much as possible. Uh, you know, those are the things I think we're already giving the safety tips. So, um, you know, I think bringing these uh, experiences of other people, having uh, people who have started car pulling in the first few days, bringing their experience to other people. Um, and I'm bringing some of these concepts that you're already, uh, you're already um, interacting with some of your neighbors uh, when you are going for grocery to the you know grocery stores, you are already um, interacting with. When I go into the company, right, I'm already interacting with a few people. Uh, so carpooling will be more focused on uh, people traveling with their friends, with the people in the society, people in their companies. So just bringing these aspects to people and helping them to stay safer with some of the tips like masks and sanitizers. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Amit. Very quickly, if you can, and then I'll move to uh, we'll move to others. Sorry. So for us, uh, safety from coronavirus, that takes, uh, I think, almost 80% of our communication, followed by the sustainability part, uh, because as a company, we care about these two things, uh, sustainability and traffic congestion. So we are also saying that, hey, now nature has healed, it got time. So let's not go back, uh, whatever we got because of coronavirus, let's preserve that, protect that. And we are using this opportunity to also push our agenda on the policy front. Uh, we are nudging the government. Uh, they should invest into sustainable mobility infrastructure, uh, create uh, incentive structure for EVs to happen, for example. So this is what uh, is our focus area. Yeah, I'm sure EVs is one of the things that uh, we all will look forward to. Uh, Akash, uh, uh, words from you, please. 
Yeah, I think one of the big things that we've seen happen uh, is that a lot of players who were not uh, maybe using our vehicles for deliveries are now looking specifically for an EV because now everyone has got some time of thinking or some time of you know planning, and when they look at their unit economics, their numbers. Definitely, EV makes a lot of sense uh, versus a petrol. You know, you're saving one third of your costs on every delivery, which is which is coming out to be a big uh, you know focus area. And over the last uh, you know two three weeks, thankfully, we've received a lot of these queries that people are wanting an EV to shift their entire fleet, uh, you know, from the petrol bikes. Uh, so definitely, as uh, you know, this is the time uh, where uh, we need to get the supply chains right. And once the you know, lockdown is open. I think EV will get a lot more demand. Also, you know, on the side of personal mobility that uh, you know we provide, uh, it's it's it should uh, you know see a better you know pickup uh, as as times uh, get right. And even uh, what what we need to do at this time as a shared mobility player is to be closer to our customers. I think one of the key things for us that we are doing at Zip is you know doing the calls to our top users, churn users to understand that what will what will be, uh, you know, their requirements once they get back out of their houses while we give it, and we are uh, staying in constant touch by delivering something at least to them by grocery or, uh, you know, uh, food. So, so that's what we are trying to do. And, and, uh, you know, keeping confidence, sharing, you know, those nudges on social media and, you know, emailers coming out clean that, you know, this is what we are doing as a company, whether even it's cost cutting or, you know, uh, strategies to implement at the moment, we've been very, very, you know, communicative and transparent to our users. And I think that's what entail uh, for, for the better time. Okay. Okay. Just uh, uh, Rajiv, I'll come to you finally. So, uh, of course, this question is there that, you know, what uh, what uh, needs to be done to gain confidence. And also, I have an additional question for you that now, uh, with no vehicular pollution, no petrol use, no diesel use, we have seen the environment becoming too uh, good for us. So as the two gentlemen here said that, you know, EVs is where uh, people may not understand EVs a lot, but we will be seeing more uh, money coming into the EV space. So uh, obviously EVs is a long-term trend that is going to continue to go on. So Akash is absolutely right in terms of emphasizing it. But I'm going to take actually a cue from what Lakshana said. Look, you know, when, when bad times happen, the humanity has to show their best face as much as possible, right? I think that I think is an important element of the story. So I would actually say the emphasis for, um, you know, mobility, obviously, but most businesses at this point in time is to take care of the most vulnerable. Right? So you've got employees, you've got gig economy people, you've got people that are working that do not have too much of an option or too much of a storyline. They might be suffering. Those are the people that you should be very careful about. Those are the people that you should be putting most of your emphasis on at this point in time. See, the business is what it will do. There is not too much you can do to make that business work at this point in time. That's the truth of where you are at the moment. right? So you will do what you need to do in that space and you'll try and make that happen as much as you can. But what you absolutely have to be very careful about is to make sure that that sustainability piece that Amit mentioned, which is essentially to make sure that the ecosystem that is working with you feels safe, feels you know sort of you know secure when they are working with you so that's one part of it as it were and there is another benefit to this right so from a brand perspective right when you think about um, you know what the typical consumer is going to take away right now the consumer's emphasis right now is mostly focused on these kinds of uh, these kinds of stories these kinds of news everybody wants to know more about what's going to happen to covid how the economy is going to react to this how his or her life changes after all of this. And at this point in time, for you to come out with a solid message that says, look, you know, we care, we will take care of society, we'll take care of people that are with us who are vulnerable, that's a very positive message and that creates much more sustainable um, angles for you going forward. And that would be something that I think you would be looking at. It is really true right now, isn't it, that, you know, there's very little marketing money that's being spent on consumer acquisition because there's no consumer acquisition to be made right now as a, as a truth of this. So I think the emphasis on the social side, the emphasis on the human side, the emphasis on the fact that, you know, the worst in crisis bring out the best in humanity, I think is perhaps one of the underemphasized parts that I think really matter in times like these. And the brand actually gets a lot of benefit because of things like this. Uh, I just thought I'll just put that in there. Thank you so much, Rajiv. That was really uh, helpful. So we have uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, from our uh, from our attendees. So first question, I think we are going to take is from uh, Ashwarya. 
Uh, if you can have uh, the, uh, the audio. Aishwarya has a question, I think, uh, if you can have uh, the audio, please. Uh, hello, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are, Aishwarya. Go ahead, please. Uh, so, I wanted to understand from a consumer behavior and cost uh, uh, giving perspective, uh, does the panel think uh, people will prefer to buy or rent vehicles or carpool with friends or colleagues? Okay. Lakshana, would you want to take that? Yeah, I think people would want to carpool with friends and people from the same company and the same society. Again, spending, um, you know, to buy a new vehicle is not something that everybody can do. Uh, people are also slightly worried about their jobs and the economy. So, um, you know, my view is that spending to buy, not everybody will be able to do when there is an option of carpooling with uh, your friends and your society and company people. Uh, the next question that we have is from Anand. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, okay, I have a quick question for Lakshna again. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, a lot of office, a uh, lot of offices, a lot of organizations are going to prioritize uh, uh, employee safety as we speak. Uh, how will carpooling impact the office goals once lockdown opens up? And uh, this is the biggest uh, population of daily commuters as we see it. So what is the impact going to be like? Yes, yeah, so Anand, the um, SRI does over the last few years has partnerships with 500 plus companies, small, large, medium, all sizes. And actually uh, companies are also worried how employees will come to work, uh, you know, once uh, the lockdown opens. And they have over the last two, three weeks, they have already started reaching out to us for uh, us to help them in this process. Uh, because again, you know, public transportation and cabs is not people want to do. Companies also are kind of, uh, you know, struggling with the, uh, you know, the cost and they don't want to uh, incur a lot of cost trying to bring employees back. Some companies also had to ship computers, as you know, uh, to the employees, um, you know, right when the lockdown happened without a lot of notice. So they have to get them back. So cost is also a concern for companies. They don't want to spend a lot. So we've been helping companies um, to, you know, send those messages Companies have been sending emailers uh, for estride, carpooling, uh, encouraging employees, saying that this is an option available and they should use it to come with their friends and neighbors uh, and the same company people. Okay, Lakshana, we'll just take one final question and uh, that is from Malini. Can we have uh, the audio, please? Uh, hi, this is Malini here. Uh, my question is, do you see a demand in the mobility industry post COVID as more people prefer commuting by private vehicles and how is the industry geared up for this? Yeah. Well, as I, uh, I might, uh, you know, take this, uh, see, uh, I agree, but, uh, uh, you know, that people would want to ride a personal vehicle, but that also comes with the fact that not a lot of people would be in a position to buy a lot of, you know, vehicles who don't have the vehicles, which is why mobility will, um, you know, remain and shared mobility will remain one of the tools for them to commute because commute can't stop. Uh, and uh, which is why a lot of players, uh, including Ola and Uber, might come up with plans of, you know, rentals or uh, rent to own plans or, you know, keep the vehicle with them. Dedicated uh, driver to vehicles also could be a norm. But yeah, uh, a lot of uh, players like ours would be thinking that what are the new normal, uh, as the word is out, uh, would be and, and planning uh, accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akash. We have really run out of time for the next session, so we'll have to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rajiv, Lakshana, Amit, Akash, for uh, being with us here today. I'm sure that this was uh, uh, very informative and ed educative for all our attendees, as well as for me and uh, people who are watching us on uh, uh, watching us uh, uh, speak here. Uh, thank you so much, Mikey. Uh, what I think is that uh, 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 as Rajiv said, that it's too early to read into it, and others also said that you know we need to commute. We'll we'll have to commute. So things will, things will evolve, and we will find out ways uh, to you know survive, and uh, everything will be uh, back on track hopefully. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Pritima, I'll uh, over to you uh, to for the third session, please. Thank you. Thank so you, Saurabh.
appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank so you much. so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, all the panelists. It was a fantastic session. Uh, moving on to our next session, and uh, this also happens to be our last session for the day. This will be for about 45 minutes, and we'll talk about shared services. Our speakers for this session are Ajit Karampani, founder and CEO for Lenso, Raghav Belwadi, founder and CEO Hype, Sam Subramaniam, CEO Brand Capital, Anjul Seni, CEO Flyro. Our moderator for this session is Punita Sabarwal, deputy editor, Entrepreneur India. And over to you, Punita. Thank you, Prithima, for the kind introduction. So in this session, we are going to discuss uh, the e-commerce, retail, and rental of brands and how they are rethinking their business models. I have an interesting panel out here with three entrepreneurs from fashion, furniture, and mobility space and a leading investor from shared service space to give a great perspective to it all. So without much ado, let me start. Uh, let me start with you, Anshul, first. Anshul, what's your take on the clothing rental space? I mean, what kind of impact it had on the business and how you think you are going to cope up with it post-COVID-19? Sipunita, uh, for us, uh... My sense on the business is that uh, currently, of course, the business is impacted because we are directly connected to occasion wear and since occasions have stopped happening, all orders have got cancelled. But uh, my sense uh, with the business is that uh, post the COVID crisis, there definitely is bound to happen a lot of economy slowdown and people would prefer buying, uh, prefer renting against buying uh, and rental shared services like ours would probably gain more traction. What numbers were expected to achieve, be achieved in 2023 would probably come by 22. So that's my sense on this. And uh, with respect to, of course, hygiene, since, you know, we've been one of the niche uh, designer aware on rent kind of players. Five years since the beginning, our primary focus has always been on hygiene. And to, you know, at the same time, we have to uh, put it across to the user how we are doing it. So that's one standard practice that we've been following for a while now. So yeah, my sense is that, that there definitely would be a little slowdown for a bit and then the growth would be faster than expected. And uh, as we speak at the moment, uh, we are also in the same time planning to have strategic partnerships with other brands and rather than just sticking to occasion wear category, probably uh, start working on uh, everyday rental categories, uh, that kind of model subscription models that we had anyways planned for the company, but maybe post two years, but I think it's time to work, start working right now because uh, buying consumption patterns will change. And uh, that's my sense on this. Okay, sure. So Atil, when you talk about uh, safety and being more agile towards how consumers look at it, I mean, are there any steps that you have taken? Can you share some more details around it? Uh, sure. So as a routine practice, every product is dry cleaned and every product is steam ironed when as this is a routine practice for us not just because of covid but otherwise it's a stream iron and the way we package is that we have to pack the product the, uh, the garment in a ziploc bags and then put it in a cardboard box so it's basically not touched by the outside carrier anyway so this is the usual practice that we've anyways following till now but now currently we are in the process of uh, thinking on innovation and developing sort of uh, UV, uh, UV sanitization rooms for garments that, you know, garment has to be put in a room for a uh, seven to eight minute period. So it, it's virus protected. So otherwise also our chemicals that we've been using for dry cleanings and steam iron uh, acts against uh, common colds and viruses. But specifically for COVID, we've been working on this, that certain level of UV is required to create those rooms. And I think it's not just us. Every retail garment fashion pro uh, brand has to come up with these because people would try. And another interesting aspect of the business for us is we were anyway in the midst of coming up with our pilots were done last year. We were anyways in the midst of coming up with virtual trials. Uh, so even at the store, people don't have to physically wear every product. They can virtually on a screen try say about 20 shirwanis or 20 langas and finally shortlist one or two and then physically try those. So we are anyways working on those uh, categories, but now the, the pace has to be faster for those things. Virtual trials and all those would come up faster and that would be uh, solving these problems. And apart from this, like basic SOPs on hygiene and COVID sanitization, staff, 
being equipped with all this was anyways being a practice which we were following we were following from first march onwards okay interesting coming to you ajit i mean how are you dealing with uh, these concerns from consumers about being renting a furniture renting being safe for uh, furniture rentals sure thanks apneeta thanks for inviting me over uh, are you able to hear me clearly uh, yeah speak for me okay so um what we've been always facing this questioning it's 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 not specific to covid um, how can somebody use a bed or a sofa that somebody else has used right? this is a question that we've been facing since the time uh, we fully launched in 2015 um you know the first question that we start off with do you ask this question to uh, hotels like hilton you know the bed that you're sleeping on has been slept in the past few days by somebody else right uh, that's because number one the brand and the number two the amount of effort that goes into getting your bed uh, pick and span when it goes into the customer's house so that's the same philosophy that we follow uh, when it goes into your house the bed that goes into your house or the sofa that goes into your house it has to look better than new it is in fact we claim that it is new itself because what we do when it comes back from somebody else's house it goes through a full flesh refurbishment process just like how anshul was mentioning um and uh, you know multiple rounds of washing uh, uv cleaning um and sometimes we actually change the entire upholstery itself right so depending upon what is the extent uh, of uh, refurbishment that is done we do do that um but so uh, the biggest and the most important thing for us is that when it leaves our warehouse it has to uh, the customer that is who is going to use it and going to pay for it he or she should not feel that she is using a rental product it has to be better than you and an indian customers are finicky enough to say that hey i am um i am paying for this and i expect the best just because it's rental doesn't mean that you need to give a lower quality product so that's that's been the mantra for falenko from day one so so yeah so it's a um it's a multi step refurbishment process in fact we have the largest refurbishment center in the world uh, furniture rental is not very um, prevalent in in worldwide so you've seen that we seem to be the only ones having the largest facility it's it's there in bangalore now we're setting it up in all the places we've realized that it is like a mini factory to do to actually refurbishment um so yeah so uh, difference between pre covid and post covid is just that we're going to reemphasize the fact that we already do it it is as good as new your furniture is as safe as anything else that is out there inside a hospital inside a bed which has inside an icu which is as clean as uh, it has to be for what you mean it so so but during this time has there been more concerns coming from consumers or uh, you had to put the point across uh, in a different manner all together in terms of marketing and branding so, yeah, i mean um, for one the operations are shut right now so uh, we aren't marketing anymore uh, there are no messages going out as, uh, as of now except for customers per se so uh, new customers um, well it's not happening as yet so no sales are happening but then um, yes there are plans if you go to our website right now you will already see as to what are all the things that we are doing from a covid-19 perspective uh, we will increase the messaging on that front uh we basically have to men- say everything that we do in some form or sense um it will be through video uh, tutorials it will be through uh, you know uh, customer messages multiple di- multiple different channels are going to be used to convert this particular message as of now because sales are not happening uh, no questions are being asked but i do expect that some of these questions might come here and there okay sure so raghav coming to you as a luxury mobility startup what are you doing to minimize the impact so yeah, hi um uh when when we were hit by uh, covid um, whether it's luxury space or uh, we are we are in a kind of uh, uh, border between shared services but at the same time we are also in luxury um luxury from an economy point of view i don't think uh, we are worried much um but when the covid issue um uh, you know hit the entire globe uh and the and the and the world went back to its basics that no everything needs to be hygiene um certain things had to be uh, in in certain uh, in fashion and when we look back our own operation manual and our sops um our cars have always been extremely clean you know as somebody already said um the expectation is very high if, under any category especially in luxury it's actually it's, it's even more um so cars 
have to be spick and span, they have to be in sparkling condition. So we always had sanitizers, wet tissue papers, newspapers, mineral waters. And this came as part of our uh, industry as a vertical. Uh, but then the emphasis is now more on, like we added um, like thermal guns to check temperature. I don't know whether we're going to use it for like ever, but um, at least in the, in the beginning months after we, uh, the lockdown opens, uh, we have started installing, like when we started our startup, we, we did these uh, breath analyzers mandatory. You know, at the end of the day, shopper is a shopper. Uh, and uh, before and after the trip, we wanted to make sure the safety of the passengers. So but now this is another phase for us. So, the, so thermal guns are going to be part of our uh, inventory now, uh, before and after, including the shopper, which, who is the main carrier of, um, of all the passengers. And, um, and, the, and uh, you know, it's kind of sanitizing the entire car. We are in discussion with a couple of um, you know entities where we could uh, there is a blast and clean kind of uh, system somebody had uh, given a demo which is very interesting slightly expensive but we are um, you know arguing with our uh, providers that no, we should go for this but because this is irrespective of COVID nineteen um, these things may be prevalent in in future you never know you know because we cannot hit the uh, you know inventory whenever there is a, a, a crisis like this. So, um, but, you know, so uh, as, um, as Ajit was saying, the, um, the sales, we have stopped completely. Um, some of the economical shared services mobility can offer free cars and, you know, free transport to the government and to the, uh, to the health workers. We couldn't do that um, because we, our segment was different, but we tried to do that as much as we can. But the time we have right now, we utilized in um, uh, preparing this checklist much better for future, uh, adding a couple more things uh, for any pandemic outbreaks like this. It could be something else tomorrow. So our ability to disaster management, you know, address has to be something better. We are working on this. Other than this, you know, as I just said again, uh, there is there's not a lot of uh, marketing communication we do. We sent only one message when that went out from my, um, uh, desk as a CEO that this is what we are taking measures and we are not going to be operating in, in these, these cities. Um, and, uh, and afterwards, we are only keeping our customers entertained with some boot camp, you know, and stuff like that, so that we don't, you know, hog their mind and thinking every day. Um, can make the same message over and again, but things are in place. We are working on that. Once the lockdown and everything is come down, we're going to start a share checklist at what we have done and how we have used this um, downtime. Okay, sure. So coming to you, Sam, uh, there are a lot many shared services businesses in your portfolio. So, and like in green room chat session, you also mentioned there are still a shared services business in Sam Capital is investing even now. So have you uh, taken a different lens altogether to look at the kind of investment you would be making again in shared services space? So I'll say this, uh, first, uh, thank you for having me and uh, very refreshing to hear the positive outlook from the three promoters on this panel. I'm a, I'm a um, cup is completely full optimist. I am the light is inside the tunnel optimist, okay? Um, I'll say it this way. You see, a lot of the world today is trying to evaluate this crisis from its weakest point, okay? Uh, as Winston Churchill would have said it, uh, he said it in 1942, this is not the end. You know, we are seeing some improvement in different markets. This is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And that's extremely important for us to have perspective in. One important thing to know is this is a moment in time and the moment when time and people and businesses and whatever we do in our life stood completely still and it'll stay there for some period of time. But one thing where I think a lot of people are underestimating the power of humanity is that no virus can beat us. I've studied now in the last uh, four weeks, the plagues back in 1500s, uh, the, uh, the series of plagues um, 
and uh, the Spanish flu in 1918. After every one of those, the world came back with more innovation, more strength, more success, and not less. Shakespeare wrote some of his best plays during the plague lockdown, okay? So, and we learned how to make vaccines so much better after the 1918 Spanish flu, which actually killed one in six Indians. One in six Indians died. Today, we have about 800 some Indians dying. Guys, let me tell you, three to five people die every day in Bombay Strain in various accidents. Three to five people. So that is, that is about 120, 130 people dying every month in accidents. And how many people die in car accidents? That number is zero now. Okay, so the total number of people dead in India is actually less this month with COVID than without COVID. What I'm trying to explain to you is there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of pain. I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the root cause of this all. And I'm saying that our habits, our behaviors, we will go back to it completely. And we'll go back to it with raging zest because we will want to go back to normalcy. That is the only way we would have told this virus and ourselves that we have defeated it. So that's one thing. And mark my words, we're going to get to that. That may take six months, four months. Number two, shared service specifically, right? Why do people go to Fulenko? Why would people rent a, a clothes or a car? If you can afford, if you can buy 10 Maybachs and Mercedes Benzes, you won't go to high. If you can afford the, the latest uh, Sabia Sachi clothes and you can just buy them, you are infinitely rich. You won't rent. The reason, the fundamental crux of shared economy is that we want to aspire for something that we can't afford of a certain quality. So if people are renting Ajit's furniture. If they have to buy a, a furniture for their office, they can't afford that quality furniture. They'll get below. So they are stepping up. That is human. We all want something better that we can afford. So we say, let's not own it. We only need it for a period. Let's enjoy it. And we save some money. It's both. Okay. If the shared services is bad quality, people won't take it. Fundamentally, people are learning. 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, rentals were not so big for apartments in Bombay. Today, it's very big. The reason is you make a rental contract with somebody, they don't kick you out in six months. It's a contract. But 40 years ago, people worried. The same way furniture rentals, Ajit will give you furniture for three years, and if it breaks, he'll replace it. He won't, he won't say screw off. So there are contracts, there are systems, there is trust, and people, people rent. And the garments that, that we heard about, yeah, why not? It's such big business in America where I came from. Why? Because people want to wear a different cocktail dress when they go out for every party. Why shouldn't they? So all I'm saying is the construct that these things will go away is completely a fallacy. It'll stay, it'll get stronger. But the problem is in the near term, cash flows are affected for, for these companies. Business is shut. So those companies that can manage cash flow, that can survive and sustain, will actually come out stronger. And those that cannot, some of them will die. We have over, over 800 companies in our portfolio. All of them are brands. I fully expect 20, 30, 40 companies to really suffer. But I fully expect, you know, we have Grofers and Big Basket and these kind of companies in our portfolio. They are done phenomenally well in this close down, in this lockdown. So my point is, uh, we have invested in a lot of shared service companies, Uber, Airbnb, Tora Cabs, Blue Smart, Nestaway, lots of them. We have more than a dozen already. And I think going forward, what will happen is the reason why people went to shared service is not because they're poor. It's not because they didn't have money to buy the car. It's because they want different experiences with the money they have. They don't want to just live it so like this company called uh, saffron stays they let you go for a holiday and stay in a different villa okay that is actually a unique experience you cannot buy a villa in all those places you go so they give you that slice of experience and that's what people want that is what youth want that trend will remain we are extremely bullish in the last four weeks i was just telling uh, in the green room we've done uh, uh, eight investment committee approvals for new deals and all of that three are shared, uh, shared services. So innovation is alive and well. 
Sure, Sam. Thanks for the detailed perspective. So when you talk about staying and surviving and uh, different kind of uh, shared services you would have invested in, are you seeing new kind of business models emerge, emerging? And uh, are these shared service businesses looking at different kind of pivots they would look at post COVID? Yeah. yeah, it's a very, it's actually a brilliant question. Uh, it's what I forgot to mention when I said these companies, you know what, you know what I say, success during times like this. I, I'm a 9-11 survivor. I was badly injured, uh, I survived, right? And I think back at that time, I think back at that time, and look at the biggest companies in the world today, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, all of them, even Apple. Apple was only a $1 stock around then. So these companies have, were all born beyond that crisis. People said in 2008-9 that the CLO, CDO, trading markets, real estate investing will die. Contraire, real estate prices in New York are at an all-time high. So my point is, people will have to pivot, people will have to change and do whatever. Cash flow is a continuous problem for all these companies, even during good times. Now it's a freeze. Revenue freeze, it's a problem. They'll have to negotiate deals, and many of them are doing it. Many of our portfolio companies negotiate Ask employees to take a pay cut for a period of time, okay? Ask, uh, uh, re reduce your cash burn. You might have to go back to investors. One of the mistakes I always see in many companies in India, which I saw less in Silicon Valley, they're obsessed with the shares they own to a point of driving it down to zero. But it is times like this, driving it down to zero, meaning this is the time to sell. If you have a company worth 100 crores, it was worth 100 crores. Today it's worth only 30 and you own 60%. Today is the time to sell 10% of that if you have to at a distress valuation and get time to fight another day. And you may come out of this and be worth 1,000 crores. But if you don't give yourself the chance, then you will probably die. So it is sort of like getting a, a vaccine in time for somebody who's sick or who could get sick or a medicine in time for somebody who could who is sick. It's it's life and death for some of them. But some of them are pivoting. I'll give you an example. Could, if there is a company that is in the shared car services or company, a restaurant, for example, a, which is not shared services, and that is facing death, is it smart for them to partner with Zomato and start doing a dark kitchen for a period now and then come back? and later open the restaurant? The answer is yes. So the thing is, we'll have to do some draconian things during this time to survive. Some of our companies are doing that. And the, the truth is, some of them may not do it. And the ones who are unwilling and more rigid and refuse to be flexible and, uh, and, uh, and, they, and they exist. And those will suffer. Those will suffer hard because this is the time these companies need cash and uh, they'll just have to do whatever it takes to find it, to live to fight another day. That's very important. So these pivots are very key. I encourage all promoters listening to this to be flexible a little bit during this time. You might have to change your product itself from being a fine dining restaurant to a dark kitchen for a period of time. You, you might have to do things like it. If you don't do it, if you refuse and be rigid and saying, this is my business principle, I won't change. Uh, then we won't survive the pandemic. Those kind of debts are far bigger than the debts due to the pandemic itself. So we'll come back to you again, Sam. Thank you. To all the entrepreneurs, uh, all three of you, so are you uh, thinking about any kind of pivot or new kind of business models going forward? Is there a plan B as an entrepreneur you would have prepared during these times? Uh, so, um... In the, in the mobility space, um, especially, um, um, Sam is right, you know, so almost all of us here uh, are more experiential and uh, no matter, even if you have a buying power, you can't just keep buying because there's no end to that. So you have to rent it something. And plus, whatever you buy, let's say, even if you buy a Rolls Royce in Bangalore, you can't carry along with yourself if you go to Delhi. You need a similar thought in Delhi. So, so our positioning, um, it, it could be for anybody. So from, for us at house, this positioning is very important. 
And as the people who once they get used to certain class or quality, they would they would want to have that over and again wherever they go. So that's one. So as a for us, I think um, I, I think as Anshul said, um, people are um, people are not blocked from traveling. Traveling is movement of humans is one of the most basic nature of uh, the species, you know, um, and that has been now forbidden. So. Even today, we have about, I mean, in the last one and a half months, we have received about 70,000 calls asking us, pressurizing that, no, we have police clearance, we have these politicians uh, uh, approval, and we need a car to go to this. And there were guys from Bangalore who wanted to drive over to Delhi in somebody's uh, uh, wedding in Bhopal. You know, we had situations like that. So it made us believe that, okay, so we can't operate it now. So that's, that's pretty much clear now. But once the, the lockdown is over, with all our precautions, I think there will be sudden outburst, which is good for business, you know. Um, people would be, uh, one, they'd be hesitating to go with, I'm sorry if I'm saying this to Sam, but um, Uber Ola kind of uh, services where um, it's a, it's a point-to-point -point pick up and drop and you cannot really commit on the quality and, uh, and the ambience of the quality inside. So people may be hesitating initially, I would say. Um, so we come in as a good option for them that because uh, it, it's, uh, it's totally sanitized and it's your own free space, it's not more hygienic, uh, the car quality is very high. So we have a demanding request right now. So we have already booking starting in end of May. June, July, August, September, until that we already have to whether we're going to ex execute that or not is a different thing. Um, depends on the situation. But yes, um, we don't, uh, we see this, um, of course, last one and a half months was a blockade. Once this is over, I think we see a, a, an opportunity. We have used this downtime to improvise on products and partnership and uh, they have come out very well. Uh, we have a good runway. Um, and uh, we are just hoping that, you know, we don't have to jump onto any plan B per se, as of now, um, and, and, and kind of look forward to welcoming the, you know, removing the lockdown situation. Sure. Um, for us, uh, Neeta, I am a 1000% believer of that every piece of fashion should be rented and not a single rupee should be spent. But till we get to that situation in the country where you get accustomed to renting everyday wear also, as a brand, as a philosophy with rented band with fly robe, we follow that uh, uh, buy the basics and rent the iconics. So all the heavy stuff like a sabi sachi lenga is what you rent and like a, a simple cotton kurti is what you buy uh, is the philosophy for us. And at the stores, there is about 30% uh, uh, section which sells the everyday wear. So for the time being, as you know, Sam rightly pointed out that you have to survive, you have to add some revenues to get the boat rolling. So we would definitely be selling till the time our longer vision of, you know, getting every people used to renting every day and subscription models pick up. So that's the way we think uh, it forward at the moment. If I may add, uh, Punita, uh, Falingo is slightly in a different space. Um, touch with, luckily for us, it's a subscription business. Um, so all the houses that we have furnished till date, uh, they remain so. Of course, uh, we're not able to pick them up for the ones who want to give up, but then uh, nobody's moving anywhere at this point of time. So um, whatever was the revenue as of end of February and mid of March is our revenue even today. So we get subscription revenue coming in. So we're able to get 97% of our revenue as of last month. There's a little bit of a leakage here and there and PAs and stuff like that, but uh, Revenues are holding um, and that is basically because of the model and somewhere I would say um, shared economy, subscription, rental, these are all synonymously used, uh, but I would vouch for the subscription model specifically wherein um, once you give the product plus offering uh, to somebody, then you get your money over a period of time, you know, Netflix and Prime and I would call Falenko in the same, uh, uh, in the vein. Um, so uh, that helps because if you build your cost structure around it, um, then uh, you don't have to worry about uh, immediate things that you need to do. Now that, I'm not saying that there's no impact to us, 
we have to wait and see how um, things will change post the lockdown uh, but there too i'm a, i'm bullish i'm 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 in the bucket that sam is pointing out uh, basically uh, uh, i believe that people are not going to jump and go and buy beds and they're going to think about think twice before doing that but then uh, beds and sofas are more basic than uh, than luxury so i believe that they would continue to rent and more people are going to jump onto the bandwagon of uh, what i call as furniture subscription so no pivoting uh, we are absolutely on the same lines uh, revenues are holding still uh, cross structure cost structures have been trimmed of course uh, we are we are working very hard on that front uh, but we are a cash flow positive company so uh, all that is helping out and we just waiting for we are, we want that the the, the the light that sam is mentioning in the tunnel we want to see that as soon as we see that i think we'll be in a better position uh, i would like to add in for the from the revenue perspective that you know for us uh, occasions have got cancelled so that's why people haven't you know taken those orders or they haven't booked those orders but occasions will happen they've got cancelled for a bit i think we we the revenues that we've lost with that they haven't lost basically they've got postponed we would eventually get them once the market opens up and there would be more number of weddings than planned by the end of this year over to you punita okay sure so do you all think that there will be new kind of shopping experiences that will emerge post covid 100% shopping sorry sam go ahead shopping experiences matlab as a retail brand i mean the way you interact with your consumer or the consumer looks at your services See, I'll tell you, uh, guys. I repeatedly, I've, I, I have done in the last two weeks about twenty video interviews like this. In every one of them, there is a pervasive fear that our life is going to dramatically change. It will change. See, uh, compared to, uh, I'm sure many of you have been to Switzerland, Japan, Germany, even some parts of America. They're all substantially cleaner than we are. even people like in japan long before covid i remember first time i went to japan in the 90s uh, they wear a mask in the underground in japan even in those days okay so they they substantially had a higher level of hygiene than we did we were a little bit relaxed chill we were happy which is why the beatles wanted to be here right and not there my my point is we will become a little bit cleaner we will we will wash our hands more uh when we check the vada pav on the street which i will still eat uh it will we will check a little bit we will become better this virus will go away guys this will go away okay and this is going to kill, kill less people than the normal flu at the end of it so i'm going to de anchor every chance i get ag- against the fact that our life is going to go for a toss it won't we will go back to exactly the way we shopped in lokanwala market the way we did before I'll tell you. Even people, uh, I, 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 I'm, I used to be from a family of means, right? So I'll tell you. I remember the story of uh, buying a a a a, a, a Hastings bed uh, years ago in 2003, and uh, and the shop was not uh, was closed in New York, right? And uh, for some reason, so I I had to order it uh, online or on the phone. I was so frustrated. because i'm paying so much money for a bed and i can't see it why because when i was young i still wanted to i was this habit of touching and feeling everything that i used to buy right so what i'm saying is we won't dramatically change we will change we'll become cleaner we'll become better i don't think we'll change the way we eat in restaurants we go to a shop and buy things but yeah will we go to the shop looking for nails and hammers no we'll probably buy that online but but we'll still go to a, a a gallery to buy a painting people will still go to a fashion boutique to buy try on a, a, a nice gown or a suit and buy it i don't think there'll be tremendous change uh there will be on the margin some changes we learn online groceries much better online shopping much better telemedicine much better all those things i can understand utilitarian things we will save our time but on the other shopping that we do buying furniture if we are spending a lot of money just driving a car i don't think we will change that dramatically um there there may be little changes people will ask for hand hand sanitizer people will ask for a mask maybe if it's crowded but in the near term 
I think in 10 years, we'll forget the mask as well. That's my view. I agree. I think um, uh, you, you're actually spot on. This is not going to change everything forever. But um, uh, in my opinion, if we see larger startups who have been heavily funded, retrenching their manpower, it's, it's a sad story. But this is the time for all the startups, if they can just hang in there, somehow manage their, without revenue, uh, their, their, their runways, a couple of months, maybe this is extended until May, I don't know, God knows when. Uh, if, you, if you have learned the art of somehow keeping the team together, uh, yeah. do something which is more productive so that you are a lot more prepared. You don't need to have like a, like a plan B to change your, or pivot your business mode, but at least you have enhanced your own surviving skills. This is just another challenge. Like without funding, a lot of startups die. Without manpower, a lot of startups die. Without the business opportunity, a lot of startups die. So this pandemic is also, pandemic is also like one of those uh, crises. So if it you is. can learn to overcome, you will be surprised probably if there is a demand for your business model, a, a good business opportunity once it opens up. But then I think otherwise, otherwise it's a hockey stick. It's going to come back and regularize and become normal. But at least it would leave all of us, uh, all the entrepreneurs, with a strong message that how you would have survived in such a total lockdown kind of a situation, which is more interesting to me than, 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 than anything else. If I may add, add uh, Punita, I think consumers... Um, where shopping with price in mind, quality in mind, uh, you know, all of those aspects, right? Um, design sense, um, you know, all these different parameters that consumers use. I think to Sam's point, we will always go back to that in some sense. Maybe during the short period of time, safety might go up a little bit. Yeah. Is my furniture clean, you know? But I think over a period of time, and that's where brand makes a difference, if as a brand you stand for good quality, well-priced, safe product, customers will start accepting it and it will go back to the norm is what it says. So brands, we as companies have a lot of responsibility in portraying that our products are safe and the economics will work the same way it is. I mean, you can't suddenly uh, double your price or decrease your quality uh, by half. None of that will work. You will have to give best products, the best quality, in the fastest possible time and that that company which is able to manage it profitably is going to win the race ultimately see i'll tell you our investment strategy right sometimes i'll tell you to uh, to your point mate about some big leaders suffering you saw several large companies uh, some of them uh, they didn't focus on uh, profitability or margins they focused only on gmb on growth and they were already a little bit weaker going into COVID, big ones, some very big ones. They were going to lay off people anyway. They were already in that situation in November, December, January. Uh, the post we work uh, fiasco, uh, profitability and cash flow of startups became as important as, uh, as revenues. And then in that environment, the way I view it, and uh, the way brand capital views it, is we think that the strong followers, some of them, and the strong number twos, number threes, number fours in these verticals are very good to be invested in uh, because the leaders, their business models are being questioned. Their generous, uh, their generous cash uh, spending business model and not the frugal business model uh, has been questioned, come into question. So the thing is, some of them are weaker, more weaker because they've loaded already. So they will take a hit. And some of the nimble some of the nimbles, number two, number three, number four, can come in from left flank, right flank, and get ahead. And we have already made some investments based on that thesis, uh, now dating more than a dozen months. Because India has been going in a slow slowdown for about 15, 18 months already. So that has played out well for us. Those number two, number three, number four are actually moving forward. Now in this slowdown, we think, with our capital and others' capital, some of these companies will actually get ahead and gain market share. That's what happened to Lyft. Lyft was way behind Uber, and there was a time Lyft was, uh, Uber offered a billion dollar value for Lyft, if you remember that. And look at Lyft's value later, it was over 20 billion. So the thing is, I think uh, uh, many times when the number two, number three, number five people play, uh, do a good job, they can actually get ahead. Farther and faster during a time like this.
So as we move on, I think uh, questions have started pouring in. So we'll read out some of them. We have some fans. Sam, some audience. Sam, the audience. Sam has some fans. <laughs> One question from uh, Mr. Roy we have is, uh, what kind of changes are going to be there to the funding opportunities in the shared service space going forward? Sam, I think you can answer it best. Can you, uh, I think your, your voice became a little sing song. I didn't hear it fully. Can you say that again, please? Sam, uh, there's a question about what kind of changes are we going to see for the funding opportunities in the shared service space? Okay, I, again, nothing will change. People will evaluate companies the same way they evaluated before. Uh, the market is large and the market is growing because the millennials are not going to dramatically change their behavior. I'm sure you all saw on TV, the millennials refused to leave the beaches of Florida from spring break. There was virus and they were trying to close Florida and they refused to leave. Uh, the people in the UK were taking their cars and going to the holiday places on the coasts and uh, lakeside in Scotland. See, my point is millennials are our future. They are the ones who are going to make us rich. They are the ones who are going to take care of us when we are in the hospital bed 40 years from now. The truth is they, their behaviors will actually amplify. So they are a shared service uh, loving uh, segment and they are the future. They're going to grow. Investment thesis will not dramatically change. People will follow the demand, but people will look for a little bit more risk management in these business models, okay? People will look for that kind of prudence. Um, if, if there is a promoter panel, promoter group where they do not have a numbers person, somebody who understands graph for finance, cash flow, all that, that's now for me a flag uh, to, to tick off because typically, uh, all these shared service companies, even other companies, they focus heavily on the marketing person, the business development person, and they focus on the technology person. Okay. Now the, the two things they don't focus on the person who can get them the money in because that's difficult. And the last thing they don't focus so much on is the numbers person who keeps track of the cash flow finance internally. And even if they have that person, they rarely respect that person because these businesses are valued on GMB, GMB and growth. I was that person in many businesses uh, where I, I raised the money, I built the business, but they always felt that they are the, the pinch hitter and that is what builds the business. But the problem is the importance of this other people became more and that's all. So we just need more robust teams, more better articulation of the, of the idea. And when you go in front of a promoter, sorry, an investor to pitch, articulate the risks clearly, acknowledge the risks, and then, and then come up with a, have a plan to deal with it. I'm not talking about preparing for a pandemic. Nobody can. I'm talking in general. Just make it a little bit more robust. Sure. So going forward, would we see more investment flowing in or there would be less investment in shared service space? What's your view on that? In the next 10 years, you will see it go up so high, we will all be shocked. We will look back at this time and laugh. It will be so dramatically high, uh, you'll be shocked. There are multi-billion dollar telemedicine companies coming up. I mean, yeah, and education. This is an area I'm, I'm, uh, I love. Children's education, K through 12 and college, all my nephews and nieces, everybody are studying tele-education now, and they are in three different countries, America, Europe, and India. All of them are studying tele-education, and they're all learning very well. So it is, so I'm just saying that people are now, see, I'll tell you, I, I bought online fruits and vegetables and eggs for the first time in my life myself during this period. I, would, I did not do that before. Somebody else was buying it in my home. And this time I'm alone. So I bought it. Now I'm used to it. I know it comes really well, nicely packed in a cold box. So I'm that unknown is known now. So now I'm a convert. This has happened to millions of people. So if you see Big Basket and Grow First, if you go to Big Basket's app, they show the number of orders per day. It's around 280,000. The number they, and they can deliver triple of that. They have more orders, but they don't have the ability to deliver. 
So the number of people who have come in uh, to these platforms is numerous today. And that will be the same case for Ajit, uh, for uh, uh, Anchel, and, and for all the shared services companies that, that we deal with. Now, the question is, how do you navigate the demand? How do you prioritize the demand? And how do you drop? So the amount of money that goes in will be multiples in the next decade. Sure. Another question uh, from the audience we have is from Mr. Vinod Baldeva. The question is, for time being, the door is closed for AI or automation. Anything connected with human capital, that is, employees or labor focused, would be in great demand, just like coronavirus. I think it's more of a comment than a question. So we'll move on to the next question. Uh, there is another one uh, from Priya Darshani. She's asking, do you think it would be a good idea to give pre-lockdown membership offers at lower prices, which they can use once the market opens? Arshil, would you like to take this one? Yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, just not just for us, but otherwise also a lot of brands have been coming up with coupons that, you know, buy this at the moment and then you get 20% extra, use 40% extra later. But the consumer's mindset for the time being right now, people are very conservative. They don't want to shell out a penny out at the moment. So these uh, propositions and these discount offers are not running through very, very well at the moment because of uncertainty. And I think it's more than uh, practicality. It's, it's the fear psychosis which is working at the moment. So everybody wants to hold on to the pennies that they have and not splurge at the moment, even for the sake of heavy discounts at later on. So this is the mindset going on right now. So we are also holding on these things for the time being. So one, uh, my answer to the first question regarding the investment was, I think Sam is right. Um, in, in the last six weeks, we closed our first ever um, funding. Uh, we had more people who are individual investors from the you know, wealth management office who reached out to us. And we were able to, I mean, we are we really not pitching in for that, but this time it does to talk to people and talk about our venture a lot more relaxedly. So, um, uh, but the good thing about COVID for us is like investment has not stopped. Um, maybe investors are looking for better avenues where they see that steady uh, business models or the, or the long-term gains for them rather than what is the kind of overnight success. So, uh, I, I I, I don't think it's going to die down for those investors who are looking at long-term and a steady business model. Sure. I think there's a question for you from the audience. So do you see B2B opportunity for furniture rental startups to collaborate with co-living spaces? Uh, there's always that opportunity. In fact, um, we had a collaboration with uh, Nestaway in 2015. Um, so that is always there, but, uh, uh, one of the reasons we didn't explore it any further is because we were seeing enormous demand from B2C itself. So when, uh, when funding is finite or resources, financial things are finite, then you would choose on the, uh, on, on the, on the areas that you would rely on, which in our case, it is B2C. Uh, so B2B, uh, per se, it's, a uh, what what the co-living companies uh, look for is an asset financing uh, business model. Uh, furniture rental, especially for Lenko, is not an asset financing business. Uh, we are into lifestyle. So we tend to shy away from that kind of, uh, you know, arrangement. But uh, always, if there is an option to co-brand, where we are creating a, a co-living thing along with Falenko, we would be open to it. Uh, but per se, we are not looking out for any such... Uh, opportunity at this point of time, mainly because uh, we have we have assets only for our own uh, B2C demand. And that demand is very high at this point of time. Okay, sure. So considering the paucity of time, we'll just take one last question. So uh, one of the questions is, do you think third party assessment will increase that who can certify and give hygiene ratings? So do you think all of you think that's going to work for your platform? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, I would, I would, uh, I would call it balanced. Um, is there a possibility? Yeah, there is a possibility, but I think it'll need some kind of a government mandate, uh, to push it hard. Um, I don't see how a third party rating, unless it is government backed can give a better, uh, you know, 
consumer comfort than what the company itself has. Uh, that's it. I'm not saying no to it. Maybe there is a startup that can come up and certify this. Just that it can't be a universal one. Uh, what goes into furniture may not apply for clothes, may not apply for cars. These are all different kinds of uh, uh, you know products. So, so a universal platform may be a little bit harder. Uh, but that's it. You know, never say no. Maybe there is a startup which is out there which can do that. Yeah, so no, also, also, I think this is uh, it's not. This is not something like really big as a as a requirement um, because for us people are paying really high value ticket and this comes as standard expectation. Um, external endorsements like this may not be so much. Uh, it has to be an inbuilt capability of ours in the industry that we are operating. For us also, I think unless the product is not new, like it doesn't move out of the warehouse and the consumer is the direct, uh, you know, that the mirror wave we have, the moment that the zip block of the outfit opens, there's a feedback right there. But yeah, as Ajit says that, you know, you never know, ne never say no for new things. But yeah, directly the consumer tells us our feedback. So we are all, all are shared. In fact, not just us for cars and the furniture also. We are very, very, very uh, cautious about hygiene since the beginning of our business because we have come across like a, see, India has always, always have rental services like mom and pop shops, but we've come to that niche level renting. So we are very, very cautious of hygiene since the beginning, but now more promotions and basically it needs to be put out more frequently than, uh, than uh, what we've been doing so far. Oh, interesting. So on that note, uh, we would like to conclude the session and uh, we're hopeful that business will pick up once the lockdown ends with uh, the great positive attitude of Sam and the rational attitude of all the entrepreneurs. So I would now, I uh, would like to thank all of you and uh, would hand over uh, the mic to Ritu Mare, Editor-in-Chief, to conclude the seminar. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Thanks, Panita. And thank you to all the panelists. I think there were some brilliant uh, inputs that have come from all of them. And Sam, you were brilliant as usual, you know. Uh, giving some great views and sort of giving a global perspective on things. Um, so, I mean, I've attended the uh, the seminar uh, uh, on, so I, when I was moderating the shared economy in real estate and then also understanding the consumer goods and the mobility space, I think there have been great takeaways that have come out of it. And from an opportunity standpoint, as I pointed out earlier also, the circular economy is where we are really headed. So... Uh, you know, we are moving from, um, you know, use and throw to use and reuse and recycle and use it till, you know, the, uh, the anything or an asset can actually give us some kind of returns to it. So that is the model we are, model of the future. Now, what will set it apart and make it more profitable and great as a business is how good or how much justice is the entrepreneur able to do with it? Uh, you know, some of the greatest brands are built in a diversity, I feel. And today, the uh, as Sam also, I think, mentioned, the, the person who will really win this race is not the somebody who will be able to provide it more quickly, but rather somebody who will be able to provide it more hygienically, but and would be able to assure the brand would be able to bring assurance of safety and security to the customer. Now, whether it is a real estate space or whether it is a furniture or fashion or um, mobility, I think going forward, that is going to be the key trend wherein uh, the brand which is, it will be able to give the comfort and highest standards of quality will be the brand that will actually do the kill over here. Um, secondly, I think B2B is going to become a very important aspect of it, whether it is about co-working or co-living. There is going to be right now what looked like a more B2C business, which was very individual-led. It is now going to move towards B2B. There is going to be an increased demand of corporates for co-living spaces. There's going to be an increased demands of big enterprises looking at a thousand, um, you know, bedroom uh, kind of a co-living space. So all that is really going to change a lot. And therefore, our businesses now need to be enabled to be able to bring that B2B service into it. I really feel that another service which all of you might want to look at is the cleaning services, because I think they're going to be very, very high in demand because people are wanting to you know, people who thought the deep cleaning was something that they did maybe once at Diwali is now probably going to become a once in two months kind of thing. Because, you know, cleanliness is going to be something that is going to stick to everybody's mind, even if COVID goes away. So yeah. let's be prepared and let's uh, build business opportunities around it. 
And thirdly, I think there is going to be a change in consumer behavior as such. So I think the first panel pointed out that people would want to live in spaces which are closer to their offices. They don't want to get into a big traffic pool, which means that they have to share spaces in the cars or cabs or whatsoever. They would want to live to places which are closer to their work. They can walk down over there. And therefore, uh, you know, so we might have more co-living, co-working kind of spaces emerging across the uh, country. They might not be as big as they earlier used to be because the earlier the thought was more about having more people in the same place. Now it's going to be on multiple locations. Um, so, so that, you know, wherever there's more proximity is going to be the driving factor rather than the capacity of the people that can be put into the premises. Um, so that will create a whole new bunch of opportunities. And I feel that, you know, as uh, new entrepreneurs, this might be a great time for them to come and explore branded co-ownerships, you know. So somebody like in fashion should actually be partnering with the fly rope or somebody running a furniture store should actually be partnering with Perlinco to explore other revenue options because straight vanilla buying and selling might not be the option in the coming times. So these are some of the great takeaways I've had from this today. And I thank all the panelists again a lot for um, coming and sharing their great views and um, we would love to probably have more of these conferences of course in physical spaces rather than on a webinar going forward thank you very much once again to everybody thank, thank, you. You. thank you thanks thank you thanks